राम राम हरे हरे It's a profound honor to welcome today one of the great devotees and scholars in Iskon who has from his very birth learned to read from the Srimad Bhagavatam and has imbibed the principles from his parents, from his gurus, and from his past lives, obviously. And ever since his last visit here to ISV, we've been counting the days to invite him back. People from all over the world who watched the last broadcast here on the life and teachings of Jiva Goswami have been demanding that we bring him back. And uh, although his schedule is very busy, we've uh, somehow or other managed to uh, get him to come back to ISV. Radhika Raman Prabhu has uh, been engaged in uh, studying Srila Prabhupada's books from a very early age and now is uh, the head of the department of religious studies at a prestigious university in Utah, and the name of the university is Utah State University. So, very happy to welcome His Grace Radhika Raman Prabhu. Please, uh, let's give him a very warm ISV welcome. Radhika Raman Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Uh, thank you for that very warm welcome. Uh, it's really a privilege to be back here in Iskon Silicon Valley. Um, I've, I think I mentioned last time I came, but I tell everywhere I go, I tell people that this is the, the best audience uh, in uh, the United States that you can find um, in terms of the quality of the listeners, the attention. Uh, that they give speakers, the quality of the questions that come. Uh, so it's really, really a treat for me. And I mean that not just as a formality, but it's really a treat for me to be um, here with you. Uh, it's kind of a... <clears throat> it's the, the reward after a year's worth of work and teaching uh, to be here. So uh, thank, you for, thank you for having me. We'll begin with uh, Jai Radha Madhava and uh, then um, continue to the seminar. Jai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jayo Radha Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Gopi Janavalabha Giri Varadhari Jaya Jaya 
गोपी जनावल गिरे वराधारे जय यशोदानंदन व्रज जन रंजन 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 जमुना तेरा बना चारे जमुना जमुना तेरा बना चारे यमुना जय राधा महाधव कुंज बिहारी जय जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारी गोपी जन्ना बल्लभ गिरीवराधारे जय जय गोपी जन्ना बल्लभ गिरीवराधारे जय यशोदानंदन व्रज जन रंजन 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 जमुना तेरा बना चारे यमुना जमुना तेरा बना चारे यमुना जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारे जय राग जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारे
जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारे श्री श्री राधा मदन मोहन की जय शिल प्रभुपाद की जय ग्रंथराज श्रीमद भागवतम की जय Hare Krishna. So uh, let's uh, begin with the Mangala Charana prayers and uh, then we'll begin. Om Ajnana Timirandhasya Jnana Anjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Jena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Sthapitam Jena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamahyam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Ragunathan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakhan Vitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindho Dinabandho Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhyaivacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So this seminar is called uh, The Glories of Srimad Bhagavatam and um, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a couple different things that I would like to accomplish in the seminar that will happen for three hours today and then three hours again tomorrow morning. And um, the, the first thing is to give you uh, a more uh, general sense of what makes the Bhagavatam such a great work of literature. Uh, on many different levels, uh, why Bhagavatam is, why our claim that the Bhagavatam is the highest of scriptures can indeed be um, substantiated by uh, the reality of what the Bhagavatam is. Uh, so today's seminar, I want to focus on the Bhag looking at the Bhagavatam uh, generally as a, um, uh, as a text, as a work of literature, as a scripture. Uh, and then tomorrow uh, the focus will be uh, uh, particularly on a few things that Srila Jiva Goswami discusses about Srimad Bhagavatam. 
Namely, as he, uh, in the Sandarbhas, he provides us with a description of the essence of Srimad Bhagavatam along with its essential verses. Uh, and also how he takes one of those verses and he unpacks that verse to give us a proof of the existence of the main subject of Srimad Bhagavatam, namely the personality of Godhead, uh, Sri Krishna. Uh, and that, those, um, uh, so today's seminar is going to be broader. It's going to be uh, um, descriptive of the Bhagavatam's place in literature, in the world, in history, and its content, but looking at it from a broad perspective. And tomorrow is going to be more of a, um, uh, a focused study of specific verses and specific ideas, particularly coming from Srila Jiva Goswami. Okay, so that's uh, the, the overall uh, plan. Now, depending on time, there may be some other things that we can squeeze uh, into it. Uh, but those are the two basic things that I definitely want to accomplish uh, over the course of uh, this weekend. Okay, so um, thank you for coming. And then during the period, uh, during the talk, at, at particular times, I will try to uh, pause. I will definitely pause and and ask for questions that people have or any thoughts that that come uh, from the talk. Um, okay, so uh, we, from the Bhagavatam itself, um, we hear about its own position, but, uh, and, and um, we'll talk about that, uh, how the Bhagavatam describes its own position. But I want to take a step back at first and look at the Bhagavatam from a, a a purely uh, academic or secular perspective as to what this work is and how uh, anyone who knows something about Indian literature would regard the Bhagavatam. Okay, so um, I think this is something very useful for us as devotees to know uh, that what is the place of the text, what is Bhagavatam from a variety of different perspectives because it can in many ways inspire us to treasure what we have in Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, in Srimad Bhagavatam, which I hope is one of the things you'll get out from this seminar, we have something extraordinary, something unparalleled. It is such a powerful work and such a beautiful work that really what we have been given and asked to study uh, is not at all a chore. It's not at all work. Uh, it's in fact something that um, perhaps is the biggest gift that anyone could receive. And the Bhagavatam makes this point at the end, that it is the highest gift uh, that we can give to anyone. So, uh, but uh, we, we hear this, but often it's um, something that we can take for granted uh, because we encounter it so regularly uh, in the temple and at home and and in lectures that we hear, we hear quotations from Bhagavatam. So it can be kind of, it can become routinized. It can become a, um, kind of a routine thing. And uh, sometimes seeing how others who do not even regard the Bhagavatam as the scripture by which they live their lives, how they praise and how they regard the Bhagavatam can inspire us, right? Can inspire us as to... Uh, just like when someone uh, f who we don't know that well comes and says, oh, your, your, your children are really, really nice. They're good children. And it, it's nice for the parents. They stop and they go, oh, okay, yeah. My kid is not just a terror around the house. He's actually a really good boy. And I did some things right. And yeah, I should appreciate. Or if someone compliments our wife or our husband, then similarly, we kind of were reminded of something that we know in heart, uh, and we ought to remember, but sometimes we don't, or often we don't. And so people, uh, the external reminder can be useful. So at least in that way, this can be useful. Uh, but also we might learn some things from people who have studied the Bhagavatam uh, for a long time, perhaps not with the view of transforming their lives, uh, but nevertheless with a lot of dedication and interest. So um, in the body of literature that is considered to be uh, that is the Vedas. Uh, 
uh, and, and Vedic literature in a, in a general sense. Uh, the Bhagavatam is part of a category of literature called the Puranas. Now, the word Purana means old, it means ancient, and it refers to um, uh, works that describe ancient histories. Uh, uh, and these histories tend to focus on the activities of the Lord in his different avatars or incarnations, but also um, on the activities of kings and leaders and great people who run this world. Uh, like the Manus, and like the kings of human history as well. So it's this body of um, lore, uh, of ancient lore, of uh, stories, of history. And as you might think from the word lore, uh, it's often a somewhat haphazard collection of different stories and ideas in the uh, in the Puranas. In other words, there will often be many digressions and things will show up there that have already been spoken about before. There will be repetition. Things will be sometimes a bit disorganized as conversations move from one way to another. Uh, and these works can become very, very large as a result. The Skanda Purana and the Padma Purana are two good examples. Huge bodies of works and Practically anything you want to prove in life, you can find a verse from Skanda Purana or Padma Purana to do it. Okay? It's these huge works of literature, and any time someone has a verse and they don't know where it comes from, then it probably comes from Padma Purana or from the Skanda Purana. They're that amorphous as, uh, as literature. They're that um, uh, difficult to navigate. The Bhagavatam is one of the primary Puranas, the 18 Puranas. The only thing is that it's so different from the other Puranas in so many ways. One of these ways has to do with the structure of the Bhagavatam itself. It is not like what I just described the Puranas were uh, or are. It's, it's not a disorganized collection of stories and ideas. It's not, um, uh, um, uh, it's not uh, haphazard in the way it presents ideas. Uh, it's not redundant in its presentation. It is one of the most tightly uh, composed works of Sanskrit literature, particularly of scripture, that we find. Uh, in fact, it's so tightly composed that one of the ways of studying Srimad Bhagavatam is to analyze its structure. Uh, and we'll talk about a few ways in which that structure can be analyzed. But it's, um, it's really written like the way you would write a PhD dissertation. Uh, there's introduction and there's conclusion. There are various arguments made, questions and problems that are raised and then answered through various stories, but also philosophical discussions. Uh, that kind of approach is unseen in the Puranas. It doesn't happen. Okay? It's kind of, in some senses, the opposite of what one would expect from the Puranas. So it's part of the genre of literature known as the Puranas, but so very different from it. Theologically, it's so coherent as well. Um, the Puranas typically present different ideas in different sections. There will be, in any Purana, there will be a section that's highly Vaishnava in emphasis, another section that's highly Shaivite in emphasis. You'll find uh, uh, descriptions that are more Tantric or Shakta. The Bhagavatam is like a well-composed argument. Theologically speaking, it's very, very systematic, and scholars have noted this in a variety of studies. How clear the Bhagavatam's theological thrust is. One of the earliest studies of the Bhagavatam in the West by an academic scholar uh, was by a scholar named Daniel Sheridan. 
uh, who uh, wrote a book called The Advaitic Theism of the Bhagavata Purana. And in this book, he explains how the Bhagavatam has a viewpoint that is, um, uh, that is Advaitin or non-dualist, but at the same time emphasizing the difference between God and the living entity. In other words, it's a view, he says, that emphasizes difference along with oneness or non-difference, uh, non-dualism at the same time time, theologically, and consistently making this point. Now, difference and non-difference, have we, does that sound familiar from anywhere? Yeah. Uh, so, yes, it means the Bhagavatam sticks consistently to this point and brings its ideas and its stories and its themes to build this point, to make it very clear. It doesn't jump around all over the place, again, as you might find in other uh, scriptures, uh, the other Puranas. So theologically, it's very coherent. Um, in terms of structure, it's very, very tightly written and tightly organized. But also, in its content, it's... Uh, incomparable uh, to other forms of literature. In terms of its vocabulary, the Bhagavatam is um, uh, very, very difficult Sanskrit. Very difficult Sanskrit. It is often said, uh, vocabulary and grammar also, uh, in, in Sanskrit circles, it's, it often says, it's often said that the test of one's learning is uh, whether one can read and understand the Bhagavatam. Okay? Uh, so, he, here's, the, here's the contrast again. Uh, often in Sanskrit uh, competitions, they will ask the, the, the person who's competing to read from the Akasha Purana. The Akasha Purana means the Purana in the sky. To read from the Purana in the sky, which means... Uh, compose your own verses, right? But with so much fluidity that it sounds like you're uh, reading, okay? So reading from the Akasha Purana means compose your own verses, but do it so smoothly that it sounds like you're reading from the Puranas. Now, uh, it gives you a sense of what I mean by the fluid nature of the Puranas. It also gives you a sense of how simple uh, the Puranas typically are in their language, in their wording. The Puranas are very, very simple Sanskrit. Typically, after two years of Sanskrit study, or even after a year of intensive Sanskrit study, they will set a Sanskrit student loose on texts like the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, or the Easy Puranas. Very straightforward, simple Sanskrit. Okay? The ideas don't necessarily have to be simple, but the Sanskrit is, the grammar, uh, the vocabulary. Uh, someone with a a basic Sanskrit dictionary should be able to get most of it if you studied a year's worth of intensive Sanskrit. So read from the Akasha Purana. With the Bhagavatam, however, those same group of uh, Sanskrit scholars and competitors say that the Bhagavatam, uh, Bhagavatam is the test of one's Sanskrit learning. Okay? So whereas the Puranas are the beginning, you could say the Bhagavatam, despite being one of the Puranas, is the test of your Sanskrit learning. This verse, uh, this paragraph that my mother quoted in her seminar yesterday from Srila Prabhupada, he used the words Bhagavatavadhi, Vidya Bhagavatavadhi, that the limit avadhi of knowledge, Vidya, is Bhagavata. Right? So there's a, a statement of that very point that we're making here. Uh, and it's true, it's true. If, you've, if you read Prabhupada's books regularly, you know that reciting Bhagavad Gita verses, not so difficult, okay? You can manage, okay? Even the longer Gita verses, like Karpanya Dosha Pahata Swabhava, if you focus and you know one basic melody, you can do it. With Bhagavatam, even if the verse looks small, it's tougher, isn't it? The, it's more tongue twisters, more difficult words, more difficult to fit things into the proper melody. Uh, and that's not just you or me. It's not just our incompetence. It's a fact that the Bhagavatam's language is very different than uh, the rest. It's difficult. And particularly when it comes to vocabulary. 
the Bhagavatam has words that are simply not found elsewhere in Sanskrit literature. So many times uh, I've had the experience of looking up a word, uh, uh, translating a verse, and looking up a word that is unfamiliar, going to the standard Sanskrit dictionary, which is Munir Williams' uh, dictionary, and finding that word in the dictionary, and the only instance of that word is the verse that I'm translating uh, from Bhagavatam, which makes it what? It makes it circular, right? You wonder, well, how does Munir William know what it means if the only usage of that word is that verse which I'm trying to translate? isn't it? Because where's Munir Williams getting his, the dictionary is supposed to be the authority, but the only way people get dictionaries are created is by examining usage of a word across multiple contexts and saying, okay, in these 500 places, this word is used in that way. So this is one of the definitions of the word. It's, it's, it's descriptive. It, it becomes prescriptive then over time. That's what the word means. You misused it. But a dictionary is created primarily descriptively. It's meant to describe language as it's actually used. And the Oxford English Dictionary, I forget what their threshold is, but they need to see a word in a particular, used in a particular way this many times in this quality of writing before they recognize it as a word that, as a meaning that can enter the Oxford English Dictionary. Okay? So, how does Munir Williams come up with the meaning of a word <coughs> that's found only in one or two verses of Bhagavatam. Uh, do you know the answer to the question? Can you guess? How would he know? I mean, he knows, and the, the definitions he gives are, are usually correct. I mean, they're, they're in, the, in the neighborhood of correct, at least. So, uh, how? How does he know that? Exactly. It has to be... It's the commentaries on Bhagavatam, which essentially serve as the means by which we can understand the meaning of a word that is otherwise not attested in Sanskrit literature because that meaning has been passed down through a line of commentators, through a line of teachers to us today. In other words, when Prabhupada says that we cannot understand the scriptures, except through Guru Parampara, except through the spiritual master or through Parampara. There is more than just faith uh, or obedience that motivates that. Definitely that point is there. Yasya deve parabhaktir yatha deve tathagura. That's the ultimate point we understand as devotees. But even from a secular perspective, you really don't have a choice when it comes to Bhagavatam. You have to understand the Bhagavatam in parampara because more often what happens than the case I described you, more frequently what happens is you find a word uh, in the verse that is frequently used in Sanskrit literature elsewhere, but the way the Bhagavatam is using it, that meaning is not used elsewhere at all, right? So in other words, if you use the meaning that you learned as a Sanskrit student, you'd go way off uh, the wrong track. I mean, seriously off the wrong track. There's just no apparent connection or a very weak connection between the typical meaning of that word and the Bhagavatam's meaning of that word. Okay. So you need guidance. We need guidance in terms of knowing what meaning should I, ex I uh, accept. Just for very practical purposes, we have to take advantage of Guru Parampara. What makes the Bhagavatam's vocabulary even more difficult is that not only does it use rare words, but it uses very archaic language often from Vedic Sanskrit. Now, Vedic Sanskrit is a form of Sanskrit that is not used uh, after the Upanishads. So, in the Puranas, Itihasas, Mahabharata, Ramayana, in all of the works of the Acharyas, all the way back to Ramana, no one's using Vedic Sanskrit anymore. To learn Vedic Sanskrit, you have to do another year or two of study after you learn classical Sanskrit. Right? It's a, 
different, often different forms, different words, different meters. Uh, so much is, is it's a, it's, many people say it's a different language. It's not, but it's, it's that different where there's no guarantee you would be able to read Vedic Sanskrit just because you can read the Mahabharata. Uh, the Bhagavatam uses lots of Vedicisms, lots of archaic Vedic words, um, which it will mix freely, and Vedic grammatical forms, which it will mix freely and completely um, us, uh, completely make the reader stumble mm -hmm. uh, as to what's happening. That famous first verse of Bhagavatam ends with the three words satyam param dhimahi. Okay? The word dhimahi, where do we hear that word frequently? Where else have we heard that word? In the Gayatri, right? Everyone from India knows dhimahi is Gayatri. Gayatri occurs where in Vedic literature? In the Rig Veda, right? It's not a, it's not a verse in, from Mahabharata or Ramayana, it's from Rig Veda. So, dhimahi is a Vedic form of that word. Now, we know it uh, so much because we hear it in the Gayatri that we don't think twice about it. But the proper Sanskrit word for classical Sanskrit is not dhimahi, it's dhyayema. Okay, so satyam param dhyayema should be the proper form. It doesn't fit the meter, of course, it wouldn't work. But that's the right form of the word for classical Sanskrit. But the Bhagavatam uses dhimahi instead, it's a Vedic form. In this case, particularly, Jiva Goswami says, in order to draw a connection with the Gayatri and say the meaning of the Gayatri is present here in the first verse of Bhagavatam. But most cases of Vedic and archaic usage are not that obvious because how many of us are, are well versed in the Vedas? Well, no one. Uh, I've, I've not studied the Vedas deeply. V very few of us will ever study the Vedas deeply. I mean the Rig Veda, Yajur, and Sama, and like that. Far from knowing the language of the Vedas. I mean, you would have to be a Sanskrit scholar and then some in order to know Vedic Sanskrit. So, that's the other thing that makes the Bhagavatam's language difficult, is the archaic usage uh, that's present there. And uh, um, you, can, you, can, um, uh, you can find this very often in all throughout Bhagavatam. There's a scholar named, uh, uh, last name is Bishwas, I forget his first name. He wrote a book called A Linguistic Study of Bhagavatam. And this huge book, and all it is, is going through every instance of where something in the Bhagavatam would cause, would stump an otherwise good Sanskrit scholar. Right? It's a huge, thick book, and every chapter, dozens of examples, Vedicisms, standard Sanskrit vocabulary that's used in non-standard ways, words that are not available anywhere else and not known. And he'll dig through the commentaries and he'll say, okay, this is probably what it means. This is probably why this word is used. Metrical forms that don't make sense, that don't fit the meter, etc., etc., etc. So you get the idea, okay? You get the idea. So very tight structure, theologically very coherent, okay? clear point argument. Unusually difficult vocabulary and grammar. All of this, these three things put together, would prepare us for, so far the image we might get in our heads is we are talking about a very difficult, very boring, very uh, burdensome uh, piece of literature, right? Like, who would want to read that? I'm going to be stumped at every verse with difficult language. It's really archaic, like an English word with ver uh, essay with thou's and these. It's like, oh gosh. It makes every school kid roll their eyes, right? That, uh, so, um, we might think, okay, oh, and very philosophical. Uh, so, we might think, well, this is uh, uh, great, something great for the scholars, but why would you or I want to read it? But on top of all of this, then the Bhagavatam adds something thoroughly unexpected, which is that it's also one of the finest pieces of poetry in the world. 
Not only is it philosophically dense and linguistically complicated, but it's actually one of the most beautiful pieces of literature that you can find. Why? Again, uh, I'm trying here not to speak from a matter purely of faith, but to give you a perspective as to what people who don't necessarily have faith in the Bhagavata as a deliver, delivering salvific work would, uh, would um, uh, appreciate it. Uh, there's one um, really well-known and respected Sanskritist who is no more. Uh, he was at the University of Chicago, one of the founders of the study of Sanskrit poetry uh, and literary Sanskrit in the West, named Daniel Ingalls. And he writes in one article published in this book, uh, which um, called, well, I, I can give you the details uh, some other time. But in this book, he, he says uh, that the, the Bhagavatam, uh, remains one of the most, he says, in fact, despite all of these things that I've just mentioned to you, he says, the Bhagavatam remains one of the most beautiful poems the world has seen. Uh, something of that, I don't remember the exact words, but one of the most beautiful pieces of poetry that the world has ever seen. Right? He's clearly in love with Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, it's, it's poetry, it's language is is extraordinary. Yeah. Just look at, for example, the varieties of meters that are present in the Bhagavatam. Uh, typically, what you would expect is the simple meter, anushtub. Okay? This is the simple meter of 32 syllables total, eight per quarter, uh, that you find uh, throughout Bhagavad Gita and um, other you know, Mahabharata, Ramayana, all written in this, in this meter. Sarva dharman parityajya mame kam sharanam braja aham tvam sarva pape bhyo moksha yishyami mashucha sarva dharman parityajya mame kam sharanam So it's eight syllables. It's the simplest Sanskrit meter. Why? Because it gives you the most flexibility to write. There's certain syllables that have determined values of long or short, uh, but the others are open, they're flexible. So typically, if you would want to compose a verse in Sanskrit, the place to do it, the meter to use is that one. Right? It's simple, it's straightforward, uh, and even with some knowledge of Sanskrit, you can try to, to write a verse like that. So occasionally, you find the longer verses. Uh, 11 or 12 syllables, trishtub. Uh, like with karpanya dosho pahata swabhava prichami tvam dharma samudha cheta yachreya syanishchitam bruhitanme shishya steham shadimam tvam prapannam. That verse is 11 or 12 verses long. I have to count it to figure out. But it's, it's the longer version, okay? And... Um, Usually, in a work like Bhagavad Gita, to move to the trishtub, the 11 or 12 syllable meter, is a major event, okay? So something happens in the Gita which is worth, worthy noting. Arjuna has been speaking in the simple length verse for all of the first chapter. And then in chapter two, he has his final moment of breakdown and surrender to the Lord. It's a big moment, right? He is no longer Krishna's friend. He is his disciple. That is marked not just by the meaning, but by the metrical pattern. You can see it. Karpanya dosho pahata swabhava. It changes into this longer meter because the mood has shifted so suddenly. Uh, or uh, look at um, 11th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Right? What's the metrical pattern? It's longer there. Deva, Deva, Jagatpate. He's in a powerful mood. And the, the Sanskrit marks that by shifting the metrical pattern. The Bhagavatam uses a whole variety of different meters depending on mood and context and pastime that's being depicted. These two are like the bread and butter. There's nothing unusual about them. The Bhagavatam does not think anything of using that longer trishtub meter. What it really revels in is the use of these beautiful, extraordinary meters 
some of which you rarely find outside the Bhagavatam, that is, before the Bhagavatam in Sanskrit literature. Uh, take, for example, the very first verse. Right away, the Bhagavatam signals that, poetically speaking, this is not going to be your average Purana. Right? <laughs> because it begins with this long meter that no one can recite because it's so long and complicated. And all of a sudden, it's like this, oh my God, this is a different kind of book, right? Long, long, long. That's just two lines. It's not even the end of the verse. Long meters, Shardula Vikritam, one of the longest meters that's present, and one of the most difficult to write in. Every syllable is dictated its value, whether it's a long syllable or a short, a heavy or a light syllable. Not easy. So then you think, wow, okay, it's going to use this extra meter, this third meter that I'm not familiar with. Shardula Vikritita, the play of a tiger. A beautiful meter. That's what it means, the name of the meter, the play of a tiger. And you can feel it in the verse. It's so playful, the meter. Very playful and very rhythmic. You could dance to the rhythm. It's that, that clear. It's very playful, but it's got a very clear beat to it. It's the play of someone who's heavy and strong, like a tiger, right? The play of a tiger. It's not a bird flitting around. It's dun 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 dun. It's it's got some weight to it. Okay. Um, so you think, okay, this additional meter present. Uh, I've 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 got a handle on this. Well, you move to the third verse, and what happens? Again, the meter shifts, right? Nigamakalpataror galitam phalam. You can't. Nigamakalpataror. It doesn't work, right? It doesn't work at all. And the Bhagavatam will keep doing this, particularly in the 10th canto. Right? Some meters that are very rare or non existent before the time of the Bhagavatam. So think here of the Gopi Gita, for example. That beautiful meter. Uh, that we've heard Bhakti Charu Swami sing so nicely many times. Tavakatham ritam tapta jivanam kaviriditam kalmashapaham shavanamangalam srimadatatam bhuvigrinantiye bhuridajana. Listen to the rhythm. Tavakatham ritam tananananana. Uh, this meter is called Raja Hamsi. Okay. Raja Hamsi means the uh, king of swans. Okay. Uh, it's a metrical pattern that mimics the movement of a regal swan. And swans are such regal um, animals. And um, this is one of my greatest irritants about... Uh, academic translations is they translate the word hamsa as goose instead of swan. <laughs> so the parama hamsa is the greatest goose, <laughs> which completely ruins it, of course, because the goose is the opposite of anything regal. <laughs> so, anyhow, so parama hamsa, the king of the swans. You can hear it. Can you hear it in the in the meter? Na 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 na. So if you've seen a swan uh, swim, it moves like this, and then it moves like that, and then it moves like this. It changes its direction as it's moving forward. Tavakatham ritam tapta jivanam kavibhiriditam kalmashapam. Such a beautiful rhythm. And for Sanskrit scholars, it just sends them into fits of ecstasy. Not because of the meaning, which is actually what's supposed to be ecstatic there, but even the, the, the um, sound of it, the metrical pattern, is, is unusual. It's extraordinary. Okay. So in terms of poetry or in terms of literature, the Bhagavatam 
is unusual. It's, it's more like uh, Kavya than it is Purana. Kavya is that genre of Sanskrit literature which its primary goal is to convey uh, poetic emotion and sensibility. This is true for Bhagavatam. Its poetic nature is true because of its meter, but that's not all. The language that the Bhagavatam uses and its um, metaphors, its poetic uh, ornamentation is like Kavya. It's very, um, uh, how to put it, the Bhagavatam's verses, verses are pregnant with meanings that are, are not easy to convey through just one translation. As in, you translate it and you lose a lot of layers of meaning that are present there because of the poetic uh, uh, indications, the poetic uh, alliteration that's there. So, for example, there's one verse in the story of Jaya and Vijay uh, when the four Kumaras are cursing them and they're accusing them uh, of being unfit to be in Vaikuntha. And one of the things they tell them is that you, gatekeepers, see differences in Vaikuntha. You see distinctions between friend and enemy in a place where no such distinctions exist. Uh, and they're accusing them of having this dual vision in a place where they should have a unified vision. But that verse, every other word that's being used to accuse them has something connected to the idea of birth or womb that's present there. So what they're saying is, we are all born from the same womb here in the spiritual world. The Supreme Lord, we're all coming from the Supreme Lord. Sajatiya, we're born from the same place. And despite having being brothers and sisters here in the spiritual world, because we have the same mother, even though they're talking about Krishna, Vishnu, we have the same mother. Despite that fact, you see differences and see some people as outside the family. The whole thing is literally pregnant with meaning, right? Where the whole idea is that us living entities, we're born from the same womb, so why are you seeing differences of caste, okay, or of family? But all of that is lost because there's no way in English to use the words for birth and womb and parentage in a way that would make sense uh, given the primary meaning of the verse. Right? So that whole layer of meaning is gone. It's, it's absent in the translation. And you could translate the verse with that layer of meaning, but then you would lose the primary meaning, and the verse would make no sense, because you'd be talking about Vishnu's womb, and that wouldn't make any sense. And <laughs> it, it, it just, it, the whole thing would become really... So all you can do is add a footnote and say, you know, I'm, this is all that's present there, and we wish there was a way to convey it, but I'm sorry, there isn't. And that's all you can do. Often verses will have not one, but two different layers of meaning like that, or words that reflect off of each other. Um, like the first verse of, or not the first, but it's the third, second or third verse of the Rasalila chapter, the first chapter of the Rasalila, which describes the beauty of the, of the, autumn, uh, of the autumn sky, which at night, the moon has risen, and it's tinged the sky red, uh, I forget the verse now, Kakubha, it, it has this beautiful uh, metaphor, Priya Priyayo, and it says, just like uh, when a person, uh, when a husband comes home after a long journey and decorates his wife's face with kumkum uh, and making it reddish, in the same way after a long, so after a long time, uh, the moon, the full moon has risen and it is like its rays are painting the face of the night sky with this reddish color. Beautiful, beautiful. But it's impossible to convey the sounds uh, that are present there, the way in which the meaning is conveyed um, in the English language. Right? It's nearly impossible to convey the richness that's present there. So 
not just in metrical pattern, but also in the meanings and the layer of meanings that are present there, in what is suggested under the surface. And this, again, is another reason why commentaries and parampara is, is essential. It's, uh, um, uh, it's uh, unavoidable because all those layers of meanings, okay, if you read really, really carefully, you might be able to catch a couple things, but not like the way these acharyas have uh, captured the various layers of meanings. When you read Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's commentary or Srila Prabhupada's purports, you see so much is embedded underneath the surface that you have to dive to get to, right? Just like uh, Sridhar Swami, he begins his commentary in Bhagavatam with this very point. He has this beautiful verse where he says, oh, where is that ocean of Srimad Bhagavatam so full of meanings? And where am I so dull-witted and slow-minded? How can an amoeba like me, a tiny germ like me, swim in the great ocean of the Bhagavatam. And yet, he says, there's hope. Why? Because he says, just as uh, the Lord lifted up Mount Mandara, which was sinking into the ocean by holding it up, up on his back in his form as Kurma, in the same way, I pray that he might lift my understanding so that I can do something worthwhile with Srimad Bhagavatam and churn its meanings, right? just like they churned the ocean. Let me churn its meanings to extract all the valuable gems that are present in the Bhagavatam. Right? So beautifully, he begins. And he gives us a hint also that, no, he's not really a, a germ. He's more like Mount Mandara, you know, very, <laughs> <laughs> very, very powerful <laughs> by that example. He's churning these meanings. And you have to churn to get those meanings. There's no end, just like they churned the ocean of milk, right? So it was for the nectar, but so much else came from it. Uh, you got all these gems, and the apsaras came, and the kostuba gem arrived from it, and all these wonderful things came out. Also poison, uh, the Bhagavatam's not, no poison there. But so many things came out uh, from Srimad Bhagavatam, churning, churning, churning. Uh, from the ocean of milk. In the same way, these acharyas, they churn and they churn and churn, and more and more and more things come out from Srimad Bhagavatam. It's an inexhaustible ocean. If we think that we've finished reading Bhagavatam, it means we haven't started. It means we have no idea of what's there. Uh, we weren't reading the Bhagavatam. We were reading some book uh, that... Uh, we just skimmed on the surface, right? But there's no limit to what's present. And, and we know the famous story of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur speaking for, what was it, a, a month? Uh, three months on the first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, um, uh, Jiva Goswami himself gives, uh, what is it, five different commentaries on the first verse of Bhagavatam? Uh, or Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur. Each one of the Acharyas gives multiple commentaries on the first verse of Bhagavatam. Srinath Chakravarti Thakur's commentary. He is the spiritual master of Kavi Karnapura. Uh, and Kavi Karnapura is the son of, um, of, uh, of uh, uh, Shivananda Sen. And Shivananda Sen. Uh, so, um, very great Vaishnava from Mahaprabhu's time. And uh, in his commentary, the whole first verse is about Krishna Lila. It has nothing to do with Brahman and the creation of the world and so on. It's a wonderful, wonderful commentary, right? The whole first verse about, um, uh, about uh, Krishna, Krishna's pastimes. So, <clears throat> Janma, they say, Janma is about Krishna's birth, Adi, and the rest of his life. Uh, uh, is which is the main subject matter, Bhagavatam, etc., etc. He kind of uh, goes through the whole thing. So, um, uh, so many layers of meaning, okay, present in uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, so, in all of these ways, language or vocabulary, in philosophical content, in its tightly woven structure, in its uh, poetic quality, and one more thing I want to mention. 
uh, which is not something that we would typically be concerned about, but sooner or later we're going to encounter someone talking about this problem, which is the Bhagavatam, uh, or for any work, it's manuscript history. Now, what I mean by that, it's manuscript history, is we have a book here, right? Bhagavatam, first canto, and you can open up the book and you can read the verses. Those verses in there, this is the Bhagavatam, right? Those verses, where did they come from? As in, before the BBT published Bhagavatam, where did those verses come from? What do you think? I mean, I don't know the specific answer to that question. Uh, but in general, where would they come from? Uh, probably another printed edition of the Bhagavatam. Okay, this was published in, what, the 70s, right? Or earliest volumes in the 60s. Uh, so, um, uh, this is coming from another printed edition. Say Gita Press, or uh, the uh, multi-commentary version by Krishna Shankar Shastri, or the one by the Gaudiya Mat, wherever it might be. Where are they getting the text? probably very early printed manuscripts. What about before that? Not quite yet. Before that, it's going to be handwritten copies of Bhagavatam on paper, okay? early versions of paper, when per paper was first invented. And already by Jiva Goswami's time, we had paper. Okay? Uh, the, the first, the beginnings of paper were there. Uh, before that, okay, now you get palm leaves, birch, you get various kinds of materials to write upon. The question is, <laughs> how do we know that each time the text was copied, it was still the same one? Means there are so many problems that can emerge when you copy first text to second, second to third. Um, The person who's copying can make a mistake, okay? Copy it wrongly. So take, um, take uh, the, uh, um, you know when you, have you watched a, a child read, a small child read? They'll be reading a book and then they'll skip two lines uh, accidentally because this word, uh, the word, you know, um, uh, play is on this line, but it's also, in the exact same location, but three lines down. So they look away, and then they look back, and they begin in the wrong place. Right? <laughs> or they're reading down, and they skip one line altogether. The end of this line, and then they skip one and start with the next. And that's children, right? But imagine if you're copying a text from one to the next, and you're going up and down and up and down, up and down. How easily that kind of thing can happen. It's called I skip. Uh, and it's very easy for that to happen, particularly in two situations. One is if you don't know what you're writing. Okay. <laughs> Most, um, well, okay, many scribes uh, in ancient times were illiterate. Now that can sound amazing, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, literacy was not considered a mark of education. The king would hire an educated fool to write for him when he needed something written. Right? He would get someone to write it down because you wouldn't, it's like manual labor, just like you wouldn't need to fix the plumbing if you were a king. Why would you need to write anything down? That's work. You just know things and then someone writes it for you. So it's a, a position of manual labor, in other words, uh, to do a scribe. Now, being a scribe is a respectable position. I don't mean to put it down, but it's, it's still manual labor. And so scribes were often not very knowledgeable persons, particularly if we're talking about Bhagavatam, right? It's, it's not very... Um, it's very... Uh, with, with a lot of these texts, they would copy because it would be like an artist. They would be able to look at the characters, they knew the characters, and they would copy. So in that situation, 
this type of problem of skipping or uh, stuff like that, making mistakes, very obvious because like children, you don't know what you're reading, you're just reading so you can easily skip because that disjunction of ideas doesn't cause any problem in your mind because you don't know what you're reading. <laughs> but then the second issue also is um, uh, if you're being paid by how many books you can copy, <laughs> then the number one goal in your mind is what? <laughs> Speed, not accuracy, right? Because what's the chances that your customer is going to go through every line to make sure you didn't make a mistake or leave out a letter or change a word or something like that? No, they're going to say, thank you very much, this is Bhagavatam, place it on the altar, read it, and months later they'll find, uh, 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 this doesn't, what, what happened here? Something <laughs> broke down. Right? Or they might not ever notice it. Right? They might not ever notice it uh, if that mistake is in such a way that the meaning seems to go on. Right? So uh, they were in a rush, and mistakes can double, they can triple when you're in a rush. All this to say that typically for a Sanskrit work by, written centuries ago, by our time, you have multiple versions. And those versions are a product of this process, which is relatively reliable. And all of this assuming that, um, assuming that the person who's copying is genuine. They're actually trying to do a good job. If they're sinister or they have some ulterior motivation, then there's no hope whatsoever for the text to be conveyed properly, right? If they intentionally leave out a verse because they don't like what it says, which also happens occasionally, right? So I mean to say you get multiple versions of different texts. This is very much the case with a work like uh, the Mahabharata. The Mahabharata is all over the place. Uh, scholars spent years working on a critical edition of the Mahabharata, trying to establish, maybe through educated guesswork, what the original might have been like. Because North Indian Bhagavatam, different from South Indian Bhagavatam, which is different from, oh sorry, not Bhagavatam, Mahabharata. North Indian Mahabharata, different from South Indian Mahabharata, different from Bengali Mahabharata, different from Gujarati Mahabharatas. And they all save Mahabharata written by Vedavyas, right? <laughs> all of them. In fact, all the way back to Madhvacharya's time, this is not a, a newfangled discovery, even Madhvacharya says that the Mahabharata is corrupted. Uh, meaning by that, not uh, the word corrupted here is used in a technical sense. It's not as in the, the message is bad. It means that we don't know the exact original text. The overall idea, no one doubts. Every version, the same basic story, uh, the Gurus and the Pandavas and the war and all of that. Uh, but all the details. So for example, Hridayananda Maharaj gives this really great example where he talks about how um, in uh, the birth of Vyasadev, uh, he's the son of Parashara and uh, Satyavati, right? So Parashamuni is crossing a river and Satyavati is the boat, boat lady. And uh, he uh, is on the boat and he is attracted to her. And um, they have a uh, Gandharva marriage, a marriage merely by consent, and then uh, have intercourse, and uh, at that point afterwards they separate, but Satyavati is pregnant after that, and she gives birth to the great sage Vyasa. Right? So this is the great story that you know everyone knows and so on, but in the South Indian version, um, you, South Indians are a lot more into ritual and proper uh, behavior uh, than the North Indians are. All the mantra chanting and the, the Vedic villages, all in South India. You don't find, you know, an Agra community of Brahmins doing Vedas and so on. It's, it's all in South India. So it was too, it's too much for the South Indian sensibility to say, the author of all of our Vedas <laughs> is born like that? This isn't right. Gandharva marriage? That doesn't count. And so they stop on an island somewhere in the middle of the Ganga. The, Ved, the, the demigods all descend and they perform a whole marriage ceremony for them 
on the Ganga, then they go out and do the act, and then Vyasadeva is born. So it's everything's proper, right? It's good. Uh, Vyasadeva is born in wedlock in the proper way. <laughs> now, my point is, how are we going to know, right? We, we cannot, practically speaking, we cannot know. The story itself is inspiring, and it's good. It attracts everyone, and, and it's, it's true. Uh, the story is true. But we don't quote Mahabharata as Shastra. Uh, with the same specificity and particularity that we quote Gita and Bhagavatam. And there's good reason for that. There's a reason why Prabhupada is not quoting verses continuously or any of our acharyas from Mahabharata except on a rare occasion. Uh, everything, every point we want to make can be found in Mahabharata. Uh, there's so much there. But it's just there's not that level of reliability that's present there. Except, by the way, I should mention Bhagavad Gita. With Bhagavad Gita, and more to our point here, with Srimad Bhagavatam, one of the things that's really amazing is you have a completely stable manuscript history. I mean, the variations between one manuscript and another from different centuries, from different parts of India, the variations are so minor that you would have practically no impact on meaning. In other words, that you could take another version, translate it, and you'd get exactly the same translation that we have now. It's very rare to find a difference of uh, a verse or more. Very, very rare. Uh, and I know this from uh, personal experience. Um, recently, uh, I was comparing the critical edition of Bhagavatam, which notes a lot of the variants, with uh, the version that I use for translation, which is the BBT version, uh, which is the same, by the way, as Krishna Shankar Shastri's version, which is a, an older version with multiple commentaries. But anyway, this is the standard version, the BBT version, which is in circulation around the world today, even in other editions. This is the standard version that you're going to find. So I thought, let's see the standard version compared with the critical edition of Bhagavatam, which notes all the differences. And it was chapter, many, many chapters, before I would find a difference of two or three words at a stretch. Right? And even when those two or three words were, it were such close synonyms or such small variations that I never had to adjust my translation uh, to account for it. Maybe in one instance, there was some adjustment that needed to be made. That is incredible. That is amazing. Even if you take the date of the Bhagavatam said by scholars, which is uh, uh, ninth century, even that case, right, uh, it's unheard of, it's unusual. The reason for that is because from the time of its composition, the Bhagavatam has been treated as careful sacred scripture by those who wrote it. Every word has been hung on. People hang on every word. Every uh, verse is so um, delicately composed that you can't afford to put a syllable here and there. And even if you did, it wouldn't fit in the meter anymore, right? Uh, it's not like the Mahabharata. And same reason the Gita, the Gita's history is so consistent. It's so, it's so particular. It's because every word and every verse has been recited and attested and, and practiced so that you can't get it wrong, right? If someone got it wrong, everyone would know. If I, if I mixed up the Sarvadharman Parityaja verse, five people would stand up to correct me, right? It would be right away. Everyone would know. So when you have that kind of book, it becomes very difficult to uh, have accidental variations and so on. Uh, one practical uh, result of this is that whenever we find multiple versions of stories that we know of, uh, say from Mahabharata and, and Bhagavatam, you find often conflicting accounts. This is one reason why we always want to stick with the Bhagavatam's version. Right? Because it's, it's the standard upon which you can judge others. It's had a consistent manuscript history. So in, in Mahabharata, it says that Parikshit Maharaj uh, was born dead. He, it was a stillbirth. And then Krishna brought him back to life. Uh, this is what they show even in the television serial, if you've watched that. And uh, um, Bhagavatam says Krishna never allowed him to die. Uh, he was in the womb protecting his life. 
So he was born alive. There's a, it's, it's a difference, right? Which version do we take? Well, Bhagavatam, definitely. In the Mahabharata, Queen Kunti's character sometimes is really like questionable. Why would she say something like that? Why would she do something like that? She encouraged her sons in the house of Lack to find five boys and a mother so that they could be burned to death in their place. So it would look like the Pandavas died. Now, can you imagine Queen Kunti from Bhagavatam doing that? No, you couldn't imagine that. Which character should we consider the real Kunti? Well, definitely the Bhagavatam's version. Right? It's unsullied by the waves of politics and the interests of kings if in front of whom it's been recited, the Mahabharata. All of that is... Um, so, we've got a pretty long list here now, by now, right? Philosophically, theologically, in terms of its structure, in terms of its language and vocabulary, in terms of its... Uh, poetic quality, in terms of its history, its manuscript history particularly. And the last thing to mention, which is pretty much the most important, is content. The actual content of the work, uh, which is uh, extraordinary and unusual. That's the one, of course, that we know more intimately as students of the Bhagavatam. But my hope is that so far you've seen that without having to talk about the meaning of even a single verse of Bhagavatam, you can already see that this is a work that is extraordinary, that is glorious and, and without compare. Right? Already, and we have not yet discussed the meaning of even one verse from Bhagavatam. So right away as we approach it, we should know, wow, we're approaching something really special here. Really unusual, really different. Okay. So considering that the rest of the seminar is going to focus on content, uh, why don't we pause here and see if people have any questions or comments about what we've just uh, covered uh, thus far. Uh, yes, Sri Vasprabhu. Uh, Hare Krishna. Yeah. So, um, I had three questions, Radhika. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, if that's okay, I'll tell the three questions, you can answer it as you choose along. Okay. Um, the first question is, you have said that Bhagavatam itself establishes its own glories. Yes. Now, that can be said true of other Puranas also. Yes. So, how can we take Bhagavatam words uh, true in that sense? That's the first question. Okay. So, the Bhagavatam, yes. Um, uh, I have a habit of repeating questions uh, in class, but everyone has a mic here, so <laughs> no need to do that. Um, so, uh, yeah. Repeating the question gives me time to think of the answer. Mm. <laughs> Usually I do that, so please. Uh, so, um, uh, that's kind of the purpose of this first part of the seminar, is to say, look, Yes, the Bhagavatam makes claims about its own greatness. Uh, and sure, you can expect the Bhagavatam to do that, because uh, why wouldn't it? Every text would promote itself. I mean, even any contemporary text will promote itself, and the author will say why this is such a great book. So, um, uh, okay, we might have to say, well, I can't really take that. Uh, I have to take it with a grain of salt. Uh, it can't be objective. But the purpose of this first part that we just discussed is in some ways to answer that very question, is to say, look, even if we back off from the text's own words, and if we back off from, uh, back down from the, the, the perspective of faith, even then it's obvious that this work is unique and it's extraordinary. So, in other words, even from an objective perspective uh, or a secular perspective, uh, that doesn't require you to believe in the contents of the book. Uh, we're talking about something extraordinary and unusual. So, 
then at least we should give good, good attention to the content, right? If you've got a work that that's good, th that's this good in every other capacity, then, then you don't expect, you know, Harry Potter content after that. It's not going to be, oh, okay, well, this was just a phone book. That's not likely, right? The content is, is very likely going to match the quality of someone who's going to put that much effort in all these other external characteristics of the book probably has something very good to say, okay? So I think that's the best we can do, is to say initially, well, look, this is something worthy of your attention because no one's going to be writing this just because they had some extra time and it was a hobby, okay? That kind of work is not written in this way. And Prabhupada, he makes this point, right? He says all these great sages, Asita, Deva, Lave, they don't have time to waste writing children's stories or fables. Not that writing children's stories is a waste of time, but the point is, why would they, right? They've got so many things to do. Why would they spend their time doing, uh, doing Aesop's fables types of, or Hitopadesha types of work uh, just to give us some nice morals or something like that? No, with this kind of level of work, uh, you expect the content is going to be pretty good. Uh, okay, um, I, yes. I'll, I'll tell the questions you can probably ask. I, I'll, I'll forget the questions. Okay, <laughs> okay. So, so, yes. So, the second question and the third question is, the second question is, why does Bhagavatam promote so many meters? And that sometimes is, it just promotes prose instead of in meter. Yes. So, how can we establish that it's the most beautiful poetic language or poetic work in the world when there is a lot of prose in between in Bhagavatam? Um, that's the second question. And the third question is, Mahabharat had had so many changes um, in the manuscript history. Um, is it a miracle that the Bhagavad Gita, which is part of Mahabharat, has been like perfectly um, kept as it is? So those are the three questions I had. Yeah, Thank so they're, they're, they're pretty short to answer, I think. So the... the um uh, the, the prose, uh, that, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, this is part of what makes the Bhagavatam so rich in terms of language, is the fact that it also has prose sections. Uh, prose, in, in case you're, you're um, that word, it, it means uh, uh, just normal writing without the meters and without the verses, okay? just like you would read a, a typical book. Prabhupada's purports are written in prose. So uh, there's nothing wrong with prose. It means there's many poetic works in Sanskrit that are written in prose, but are regarded as poetry. Poetry and verse are not the same thing. Verse is usually a good marker that something's poetic, but poetic is a quality of the writing. Uh, in, in Gadya writing, in Sri Vaishnavism, in, in South Indian Vaishnavism, you have uh, these uh, prose poetry works, which are so beautiful to read. They're, 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 they're they're poetic. They're, they have alliteration, all these layers of meaning that I was talking about, pregnant with meaning, all of that is present. Shrivish, Kalyana, Gunasaga, they're beautiful descriptions of the Lord, and it's all in straight lines. Okay, so that's, that in itself is not an indicator that it's not poetry. You would, have to re, you would have to examine the quality of that prose to figure out whether it's just regular writing or is, is it poetry. Okay. And the third question was... Oh, yeah. It, it is a miracle, but it's also to be expected. The reason it's to be expected is because when a book is... It, it, the accuracy of its transmission is directly proportional to how much that work is used and memorized and read. And if a work is used again and again and again and read and again and again and commented on, then it's likely to have... Uh, to, to be very consistent because there's more opportunities to catch errors and to fix them. Right? Uh, Bhagavatam is one of the most commented, it is the most commented Purana and one of the most commented of all script, Sanskrit scriptures. They say that there are something like 90 commentaries in Bhagavatam, but the va vast majority of those we don't have. Even the ones we do have make it the most commented of all the Puranas. Um, we have something like, I don't know, 30 extant commentaries, commentaries that are present on Bhagavatam, complete commentaries, uh, or commentaries just on the 10th canto. In comparison, the next highest bidder for that spot would be the Vishnu Purana, which has, I think, two or three commentaries. Right? So Mahabharata has maybe a couple uh, commentaries also. That's about it. Right? The only thing that would come close is uh, Bhagavad Gita. Uh, but then it's a much shorter work. It's 700 verses. Bhagavatam is 18,000. So. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Uh, 
Uh, one question related, you mentioned that uh, there is not much difference variations in Bhagavadam, right? Uh, as compared to Mahabharata. Uh, there's something similar to what I asked you yesterday. Again, uh, I heard two different commentaries within Bhagavadam itself about how uh, river Ganga originated, right? So, Prabhupada, in his uh, purport, quotes that uh, when Lord Vamana's yes. feet re uh, pierced the hole in the spiritual world, that's how River Ganges originated, right? Yes. And I heard another version of uh, Bhagavadam with yes. Sanskrit sloka, authentic Sanskrit sloka, which says when the Lord Vamana's feet reached uh, Satya Loka, Lord Brahma uses his commental gel, and washes the toe of the Lord, and that became Ganges. Yes. So you mentioned that both are true. But again, uh, I believe in Prabhupada's uh, uh, commentary, he, d- he describes that in the purport, but I don't think there is a sloka related to that. So which one do you take as authentic one? Now I see now two different way- yes. commentaries for the yes. in Bhagavatam itself. So it's a good question. In, uh, in Bhagavatam itself, you often find multiple versions of the same story. And uh, when those things happen, then usually... Uh, uh, the Acharyas explain it as kalpa bheda, the difference uh, between uh, of the same story in different kalpas or different um, uh, different creations, essentially. So, because time is cyclical, uh, it doesn't just have a beginning and an end. The same things happen again and again. The Lord incarnates again and again. So, occasionally, just like you have the red boar and the white boar, right? Red varaha and and white varaha. So, it's difference in kalpa. In one kalpa, he emerges to lift the ocean, uh, lift the earth from the ocean at the beginning of creation just because it's the beginning and it's at the bottom. So things are just not ready yet. And another time, he's described he lifts it because Hiranyaksha has pushed it into the ocean. And so both versions are there, and the Acharyas explain, oh, this is a difference of kalpa. It's a difference of, of the age, the, the, the iteration of creation, the cycle in which we're in. In the previous cycle, it happened like this. In this cycle, it happened like that. So... In that way, multiple occurrences uh, can be explained. And even the differences between Shastras can be explained like that. I, I mean, I don't mean to say that, that Mahabharata and these other works are completely unreliable. No, I mean, there's still scripture and everything. And so even that, those differences can be explained in, in, in a difference of Kalpa. Uh, but in, in Bhagavatam differences, that's usually how the Acharyas uh, explain that difference. Um, yes, Prabhu? Uh, yes, Generally, it's listed that there's 18 Puranas. Now, you see in some of the Puran- other Puranas, you see when the lists are given, they leave out the Linga Purana or they leave out the Vaya Purana to include the Srimad Bhagavatam. So couldn't it be said that the Bhagavad- Srimad Bhagavatam is the 19th Purana? Um, I haven't heard that um that description of the Bhagavatam, but the list of 18 Puranas is not consistent, uh, which means different Puranas give different lists of 18 Puranas. Uh, Bhagavatam has its own list, of course, it's included in that list, but uh, the other Puranas, several others, Jiva Goswami quotes uh, in Tattva Sandarbha, several other Puranas include the Bhagavatam in their list of 18. So that list is not uh, consistent. Um, the, the standard number 18 is there, but uh, beyond those standard 18, there are many, um, many, many other Puranas. And just because they're not in that list of 18 doesn't make them necessarily small Puranas or unimportant. Uh, but some get left in, some get left out uh, at different times. But there's many, many Puranas beyond the 18. And then there's the Sthala Puranas or the local Puranas that don't even get counted in the, in, in the general list. So it's, it's not a very uh, uh, the kind of uh, consistent um, count, essentially. Um, okay, so we start from here and then work our way back. Uh, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Uh, Prabhu, you were mentioning that uh, when you were actually looking at the version, you hardly found a difference of one or two words across many chapters. But um, I have heard that um, maybe in some school, even the Vaishnava schools, maybe the Madhva Sampradaya, they actually question even the existence of three chapters in the 10th canto, yes. particularly the Brahma Vimohana yes. pastime, they question that, okay, Brahma cannot be bewildered, and they give examples that, okay, the 15th verse has a, I mean, the 15th chapter starting has a continuation yes. from this yes. thing. 
Yes. So, if it has been so authentically maintained, how we can, uh, I mean, how can we counter these yes. arguments? So, um, uh, Prabhu is referring to the fact that uh, a few chapters in the 10th canto, particularly Brahma Vimohana Leela, uh, when Brahma is bewildered uh, um, by Krishna uh, and is unaware of Krishna's identity or forgets it, that story, uh, cows and calves eating, uh, so that account as well as a, maybe one or two other chapters are regarded as inauthentic, non-authentic by the followers of Madhvacharya and uh, left out of the Bhagavatam as a result, or they feel that we insert these chapters even though they shouldn't be there. So that's a disagreement. However, it, it's important to note that that's not a uh, manuscript issue. That's a theological argument. That's an argument about what, what are the real stories of Krishna's pastimes. In other words, you have a long, uh, stable history of those chapters present. Uh, in Bhagavatam, and you have other versions, particularly from the Madhva area, which leave those versions out. But that's not a question of the scribes forgetting three chapters or something going wrong in that way, right, typically. It's something that major is an argument, theologically, and the reason, the fundamental reason for the argument is because the Madhva Sampradaya is descended from uh, Lord Brahma, so the, the idea that Brahma would be uh, confused in such a significant way is not <laughs> appealing or acceptable. Uh, and that section is regarded as not uh, appropriate. Uh, but uh, we accept it. Gaudiya Vaishnavas accept uh, that and all the other chapters as authentic, as we can see even in our own times by Srila Prabhupada, that was the final chapter he translated uh, directly from Bhagavatam, was the Brahma Vimohana Leela. So that's a theological debate that I don't think can be solved by uh, some comparative academic study. It's oh yes, oh yes. There's a long manuscript history of those chapters, definitely, and commentaries. Plenty of commentaries on those also. Yeah. Uh, this is from an internet user, internet viewer. Believe it or not, over 110 people are uh, viewing this program wow. at this time. <laughs> And this is uh, a question from Alexander, and he's asking about Mahabharata. Why is it assumed that if there are multiple versions of a work, then it is due to change and corruption? Could it be that Mahabharata is multi-branched, and that the multiple version is Mahabharata as it is? Yes, uh, good question. Um, uh, this point about Kalpa Bheda I was making, that different uh, versions of the story happen in different ages, uh, that's certainly possible. In some cases, when the differences are really, um, uh, I mean, okay, one could argue that different versions of a verse, for example, come down from the heavenly planets or from Vyasadeva at different times. It's just that we don't have any account from the Acharyas or anyone else that human beings have received in this age more than one version of the Bhagavatam, uh, of, the, of the Mahabharata. So you have to attribute it either to uh, changes by human beings or by differences in different kalpas. Now the big differences you can say in different ages different things happen, but the little differences, the variations between one verse and another is difficult to explain uh, because um, we just don't have any evidence of any kind saying that Vyasa, they've revealed one version to this part of India and another version to that part of India, or at different times another version was revealed. We just don't have any evidence of that kind of thing happening. So sure, it's possible, but it's, it's, it's unlikely. Um, uh, it's un unlikely. E even even in Bhagavad Gita, you sometimes find minor things that make no difference in meaning. Have you heard Prabhupada quote "Janma Karma Chame Divyam" before? Uh, the second second quarter, "Janma Karma Chave Div Chame Divyam," and what's Prabhupada's? Okay, what's the second line normally? <laughs> yeah, and Prabhupada very often, what does he say for that line? <laughs> Yo Janati Tatvataha. Right? Now, that means exactly the same thing. Veti and Janati are synonyms. Okay? Both vid means to know, Gnya means to know. 
Prabhupada uses yo janati tatpata. So obviously there's some minor variation there. Now it could be that Krishna has given us two versions, but like I said, we don't have any evidence of that. In our age, uh, as far as we know, Krishna spoke the Gita once, uh, 5,000 years ago to Arjuna. Uh, so while that's possible, it's not, it's not uh, likely. More likely is that you have these slight variations that come over time. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, we have another question from uh, Raseswari Leela, da Leela Devi Dasi. Hare Krishna Danvat Pranams. Thank you very much. This is Raseswari Leela, da Leela Devi Dasi. Question. Can we accept one explanation that Srimad Bhagavatam stories are woven such that they combine the peak pure bhakti points from other Puranas? Yes, um, the answer is yes for that. They def definitely bring in the elements of pure bhakti from other Puranas, and that's essentially going to be uh, the elements of pure bhakti that are present, and the content is essentially going to be the subject for the rest of today. So we will answer that question in, in, in full, uh, full uh, depth or length. Um, oh, we have another. Okay. <laughs> okay. another question from another uh, internet viewer and uh, I don't know, uh, he hasn't specified his name, he or she, but the question is, when Ramayana is recited, it is said that Hanumanji always comes to listen. Likewise, when Mahabharata is recited, does any personality come in a hidden form to listen? <laughs> Thank you, Nandin, your servant Nandini Radha from New, New Dwaraka. Okay. Um, I don't know if anyone comes and listens with Mahabharata, but I know with Bhagavatam, Prabhupada says that Narada Muni and the great uh, sages, demigods, they're, they're present wherever uh, Bhagavatam is recited. Uh, so he, he says this on, on a couple different occasions. So with Bhagavatam, we know. Mahabharata, I, I don't, unfortunately. Uh, so, yeah, Prabhupada. Thank you, Prabhu, for wonderful class. I'm waiting for more. I have two short questions. First uh, is you were mentioning that how even in the category of Puranas, that's how you started that um, Srimad Bhagavatam just stands out. It doesn't belong to the category of Puranas. Yes. I had a question. Does it resemble other Vedic literatures also? Like is it more Upanishadic or... Um, yeah. smrit, smritic, if that's the word. So, so I can answer that question with a, a, a really nice anecdote. Uh, when I was studying in Oxford, we had a visiting professor there. Uh, his, I may have mentioned him actually last time. His name was Professor Narasim Hachari. Uh, he was, he's passed away a few years ago, but he was uh, the head of the Department of Vaishnavism and the founder of that department at the University of Madras but he had visited Oxford maybe three or four times while I was a student there to teach there. And so much of what I learned about Sanskrit came from him. And um, one semester he was there, he decided to give a seminar on Bhagavatam, particularly the 10th canto. And um, after the first, or maybe it was the second class, he pulled me aside and he said, Ravi, you know, uh, I'm... Uh, I'm not being proud when I say that I have studied all of Sanskrit literature and all the Vedas. He said it's, it's just a fact. He, he had, you know, he had studied everything out there. Um, all the Acharya's commentaries, Vedanta Sutra, Sri Bhashya, Shankara Bhashya, it was all there. It was very, very learned. And, uh, and he said, but I'm really going deeply into the Bhagavatam for the first time. And he said, I can tell you that in all of my studies, I have never read a book so wonderful like Srimad Bhagavatam. He said this with tears in his eyes. And so you can really tell that it's, it's, um, uh, it's very difficult to place it in a category. I mean, it is in the category of the Puranas. Uh, technically, but in terms of everything we've discussed, it doesn't fit anywhere. It really doesn't. Uh, it's difficult. You can't put it in the realm of Kavya because Kavya is never philosophically very dense. It's all about poetry and emotion and romance and things like that, but not, you know, 
sajjanma jisayata and like that. It's, that's too much philosophical. for. So it really bucks all categories. It just breaks them apart in many ways. So it's very difficult to compare it. Thank you. Um, and the second question is, uh, in Brihad Bhagavat Amrita beginning, we see, I think, Janme Jay is, or I don't know, there is a description that he liked Jaimini's Mahabharat more than Vaishampayana's Mahabharat. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And these are two different uh, speakers, and why, why is he saying he liked Jaimini's Mahabharata more than Vaishampayana's? Are these two drastically different? Or? The Mahabharata has always had multiple versions because it was always meant, it was a history meant to be recited in the courts of kings to, to preserve the history of uh, greater India, right, to preserve that history. It was told by different singers and bards and, and great sages and so on. And different aspects were told in more detail and just like, just like we do, right? Sometimes we tell a story and different audiences will tell the story with different levels of detail. And some things will omit in one place. And so, so you get different versions and this is another point. It's not necessarily the case that the, either one is incorrect. I could be adding some details here because I think you'd be interested, whereas leaving those details out here because I don't think she would be interested. You know, so that kind of thing it, would happen all the time with Mahabharata. What's the mood? Right? Are they focusing primarily on Krishna and his activities? Krishna was active all throughout the story of the Mahabharata, but in the version of the Mahabharata we have, only certain parts talk about Krishna. What was Krishna doing the rest of the time? Right. So one version might talk about that more. Another version might talk about something else. Yeah. Hare Krishna Prabhu. <clears throat> so we heard about uh, two classifications of uh, anti literature. Uh, one is uh, that preserved its authenticity, and you also mentioned that five people will stand up and challenge and say something wrong. The other is which lost its uh, authenticity and genuineness and it got uh, disgraced, right? Um, so my question is what leads to, what leads these scholars, the nation, I mean, these uh, historians to preserve one certain kind of literature over the history. One possible explanation could be the devotional service or the attitude towards the Krishna, right? But at the same time, we have seen Brahma Samhita, which has lost everything but one chapter. Even though it is the same as like Bhagavad Gita. Oh, so your question is what causes uh, something to be preserved over time yes. versus others left out? Uh, so um, uh, there's two, exp two answers to that question. One is from a spiritual perspective, which is that Krishna reveals and hides certain texts and certain scriptures depending on the needs of the audience. Uh, Jiva Goswami makes this point in the Sandarbhas. He says, depending on the needs of the audience and, and the readiness of the people, uh, when the time is right, then works such as Brahma Samhita are revealed, uh, or even Bhagavatam is revealed. And when the time is not appropriate, then it's uh, held back or it's hidden over time. Krishna makes the same point also in Gita, right? Uh, that, uh, but there it's not Krishna, it's, the, it's human weakness that causes textual corruption. Uh, that's actually a point I, I wanted to make um, earlier, which I forgot, which is this idea that works can become... Um, um, misused and misinterpreted and changed over time. Krishna is making the same point in Bhagavad Gita, yogo nashta parantapa, right? That teaching is lost. And that teaching can mean oral teaching, but it could also mean um, uh, the um, uh, written teaching as well, right? There's two ways to convey that knowledge, oral and written. So from a spiritual perspective, there's divine reason, there's divine plan for that. And from an, an academic perspective, those works which are used and important for uh, uh, study and use, those get preserved and those that are not used get lost over time. Brahma Samhita is unlikely to be lost because there's a whole community of Vaishnavas who hold it dear as scripture. So we will preserve it, right? But if all Gaudiya Vaishnavas were to disappear from the face of the earth, well, one thing would be horrible for the world. But on the other hand, it would also, and the other thing is the, the, the Brahma Samhita would disappear over time, right? It would be likely because no one would preserve it. So you can answer that question academically and also kind of spiritually, see Krishna's hand in, in, the, in the aspect. And, and the two explanations are not incompatible, obviously. They can work together. Uh, yes, Mataji. 
Thank you very much for the wonderful answers, Prabhuji, filled with your devotion, dedication. So one, uh, all questions you answered, but the one thing that I have is first when we tried to present uh, Bhagavatam once, uh, one of the persons said that he would uh, not take this version of Bhagavatam because he only wants Potana Bhagavatam. So I have never heard of that Bhagavatam, but he was giving a very nice description of that. So what is that? Yeah, so uh, it's a South Indian version of Bhagavatam. Uh, Bhagavatam has many different retellings of Bhagavatam in local languages. Uh, there's the Ekanathi Bhagavatam, and then there's uh, Vopadeva's version of Bhagavatam, and then there's a Bengali Sri Krishna Vijaya that um, uh, Prabhupada mentions this book by Gunraj Khan in Chaitanya Charitamrita, Sri Krishna Vijaya, and it's a Bengali version of essentially the 10th canto of Bhagavatam. So many different vernacular renditions of, of Bhagavatam, and that's a wonderful thing. That's another thing about the Bhagavatam's history. Uh, when it comes... Um, Actually, this was something else I forgot to mention. Tenth canto, no? Yeah. Most most renditions are uh, are only the tenth canto, or as or else highlights from the rest. So, like uh, Prahlad Singha story and Vamana story, and so on. Uh, if if you count the number of commentaries on Bhagavatam, and if you look at the number of derivative works from Bhagavatam, books that have been written based on Bhagavatam in Sanskrit, and you look at the vernacular versions, that is, versions in the languages people actually speak, then the Bhagavatam, and you look at its influence in popular culture, and in music, and in dance, and architecture, and culture, the Bhagavatam is easily one of the most influential uh, works that have shaped the history of Indian civilization. Uh, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana are the famous ones. And the Ramayana, no doubt, it has faced, it has shaped not just India, but all of Asia, practically speaking. But the Mahabharata's popularity is more recent. Gita has always been popular. But Bhagavatam would probably be, just objectively speaking, more influential in Indian history than uh, the Mahabharata. It means if you look at the way Hinduism is practiced today, as well as throughout history, everywhere you look, you see the Bhagavatam's influence. In fact, in this uh, 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 book that Krishna Kshetra Maharaj and myself produced, it's, it's different chapters about the Bhagavatam sh by different scholars showing the Bhagavatam's impact on their area of study. So the Bhagavatam's influence on Indian dance, the Bhagavatam's influence on philosophy, the Bhagavatam's influence on uh, the concept of time, the Bhagavatam's influence on uh, public recitations and that. And you see everywhere Bhagavatam is present. It's very, very powerful. So it's, it's the fact that someone loves one particular version is not at all unusual. Uh, in fact, it's, it's one of the strengths of Srimad Bhagavatam, that everywhere you go in India, so many people will say, I read Bhagavatam, but in fact what they're reading is their vernacular version, which they can understand and they can enjoy. Just like the Ramayana. People say, oh, I love the Ramayana. They're reading Tulsidas's version, because that's the one they grew up with or they enjoy and so on. So uh, that's, that's the, the impact of Bhagavatam. Okay, I have a couple more from internet. Can I? <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, I, there's a lot of hands. Um, at the same time, I want to make sure that we get through a little bit more because our time is up to 11 o'clock and then we, we have to uh, break. So uh, why don't I go for another, um, uh, another 45 minutes or so and then we'll maybe open it up for questions again, okay, just to keep it moving. Uh, okay, so um, content. Bhagavatam's glories from the Bhagavatam's perspective and from a Vaishnava's perspective. So we can begin with this beautiful verse in the Bhagavatam itself that many of us may have heard of, right? Krishna Swadhamo Pagate Dharmagnana Dibisaha Kalo Nashta Drishamesha Puranarko Dhunoditaha Krishna Swadhamo Pagate When Krishna, he left for Swadhama, Upagate. Uh, then he took two things with him when he left. And those are Dharma and Jnana. 
Uh, he took religious principles and he took knowledge. They left with him because they are attributes of Krishna. And where Krishna is not, these things cannot also survive. So that left us in a very dark and uh, bleak age. Kalo nashta drisham esha. It left us blind, essentially, without dharma and jnana. But for those of us who have vision in this age, who have been blinded by that darkness, Purana Arko Dhunoditha, the sun, the beautiful sun of Srimad Bhagavatam, Arka, has risen and has provided that light. In other words, Purana Brahma Samitam, Bhagavatam says, the Bhagavatam is Krishna himself. It's the incarnation of Krishna that lives here when Krishna is gone, when he's no longer walking the earth. And so by getting to know Srimad Bhagavatam, we can contact Krishna directly. We can know him. We can know him in detail. The more we know Bhagavatam, the more we know Krishna. We know, we may have heard, that the Srimad Bhagavatam is described as Krishna's body, his beautiful form. And the first two cantos are his lotus feet. And as we move through the cantos, we come to his face, which is the 10th canto. And the Rasa Lila chapters are his smile. And in this way, we can have darshan of Krishna. I know when my spiritual master, Hanumat Preshaka Swami, when he used to come to Boise, when he first started the studying the Pada Padma, the first two cantos of Bhagavatam, the lotus feet of Krishna. In Bhagavatam class, he would ask us, so how many chapters in the first canto of Bhagavatam? And we'd all be like, uh, uh, we don't know, Marge. He'd say, how many in the second canto of Bhagavatam? Uh, we, don't, we don't know. Uh, so what are the main themes in the first canto of Bhagavatam? Uh, Parikshit, Parikshit meets Shukadev Goswami. That happen? <laughs> Probably in the first canto, right? Where else would it be? And so we would fumble like this. And Marge would look at us and he'd go, if Krishna walked into this room, you would not be able to tell the difference between his feet and the feet of a buffalo. Huh? <laughs> and it's funny, but it's true. It's true. We think that if Krishna arrived in this room face to face, that it would be in a whole, you know, the clouds would part and this whole light and glory would descend and we'd know Krishna. But how do we know? How, how do we know that we would recognize him? What's the guarantee? I mean, take a look at Duryodhana. He saw Krishna, but did he recognize him? He didn't. He saw Krishna every day for many years, and he never recognized who Krishna was. He thought that, uh, you know what he thought? He thought, Krishna's a magician. Krishna is really good at what he does. I can do that, most of that too. He's just a little bit better than I am, right? <laughs> and it was kind of true, because in that Dwapa Yuga, everyone had some level of mystic powers left over from the earlier ages. And okay, Krishna has a little bit better. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to this earth, so many people saw him. How many people recognized him as Krishna? Very few, right? Even those who appreciated him thought what? Oh, he's soul, right? Great saint. But he's just a little bit better than I am. Right? <laughs> I'm also saintly and I'm devotional. And my guru is saintly and devotional. He's a little special. In fact, whenever Krishna comes, whenever Krishna comes, he always gives an avenue for people to think, just so those who want to avoid him can avoid him. Hiranyaksha sees Lord Varaha and he thinks, whoa, this is a super pig. Right? But he doesn't see this is the supreme personality of Godhead. Right? He has to see, uh, this is another thing that my Guru Maj likes to say. He says, one day we will go to the supreme personality of Hoghead. <laughs> so, uh, so he says, so, so he doesn't recognize him, right? Lord Brahma. Lord Brahma, he recognizes him. And the sages, and they come and offer these Vedic prayers and chanting. Hiranyakashipu sees Lord Nishingadev, and he tells, 
Prahlad, this is your God, an animal? Right? So the point is, why should we be so confident that when, when the opportunity comes to see Krishna, we will know who he is or we will recognize him? We have no guarantee, no expectation even to recognize Krishna unless we study who he is and what he looks like. And the Bhagavatam is the best way to get up close and personal with the We can know intimate details about who he is and his form because this is his body. When Bhagavatam is present, Krishna is present right there with us, in front of us. And we're interacting with him personally. We're interacting with him directly when we study Srimad Bhagavatam. So therefore, the contents of Srimad Bhagavatam are incomparable in nature. Right from the beginning, second verse, Bhagavatam makes its uniqueness very clear. It makes us a promise. And we can test the Bhagavatam on this promise. We can test its claim, right? We don't have to take it on faith. We can read it and test it. But this is the claim that it makes. Dharma projita kaitavotra paramo nirmat saranam satam. Dharma projita kaitavotra paramo nirmat saranam satam. Vedyam vastava matravastu shivadam trayon mulanam. Shrimad bhagavate mahamuni krite kimba parairishwara. Sadyo ridyavarudya tetra kritibis shushru shubis tatkshanat. It says, dharma projita kaitava. Right away, the Bhagavatam begins. Dharma projita kaitava. We reject all dharmas. Cheating dharmas. Kaitava means cheating. Projita. They are rejected here. Now, let me ask you a quick question. What's cheating? What's the broad definition of cheating? When do you feel cheated? Hmm? Misguided. misguided is one way to cheat someone. But what's the general, what's the overall, in, whether it has to do with knowledge or with money or with buying a product? Falsify. Yes, to promise something, to falsify, to promise something and deliver something else. Right? Uh, this is what you're going to get, and instead you don't get that. You get something else. Okay? So, Religion in general, Bhagavatam is saying, is a false promise. Right? It's a false promise. What are we all looking for in this world? Well, unlimited, permanent happiness. And then religion comes along, and instead of giving us that, says, you want more money? Give us a donation. And God will give you more money. And you want a comfortable house? Well, Let's do this, and you can do this yagya, and do this homa, and you'll get a house. And you want a life free of car accidents? Come and do a car puja at the temple, and your life will be free of car accidents. You're approaching God, who is the wealthiest, most beautiful, and wonderful person, and what you get, instead of all of that, is some cheap trinkets on the side. That's a false promise. So, Bhagavatam is saying, no. All of that kind of religion is rejected. Now, take a look at it from the other side, from the, perp- from the person who is cheated. When you go into a situation, expect to put in this much and get back results like this. What do we call that person? Well, everyone's greedy, right? But even if you're working hard for money, honestly, and you want more, you're greedy. But what if you specifically want to put in a penny and get back a million dollars? A gambler. Right? From the side, so the person who's cheating, they, we call a cheater. The person who's being cheated is essentially a gambler. Right? What allowed you to be cheated in nearly every instance of being cheated? I know you feel angry at the person who cheats you, but there's some fault on the part of the cheated as well. That fault, there's a desire inside that I might be able to get a whole lot for very little. I didn't deserve it, 
but I can pull it off. So that email that you respond to, there's a million dollars out there, right? Someone in Africa who needs to transfer a million dollars here, and they'll send of that if you just hold it in their bank account. Can you send me bank details? Right? So you get cheated and the government fights against such scams. It's horrible. Those people are bad. Right? But what about the person who gets cheated? <laughs> They've got some also some desire in the heart. Right? I didn't earn the 10% of that, but I want it anyway. We call it good luck. But in fact, <laughs> it's gambling. Right? It's cheating. And so, the Bhagavatam is saying, Dharma Projita Kaitava. I'm not going to cheat you. We're not going to cheat you. But then, Nirmat Saranam Satam. You don't try to cheat us. Right? We don't want any gamblers here. Because if your heart is envious and you're not honest coming into the situation, you're not going to find what you're looking for in this book. Because those great deals, you're not going to find here. We know it's a great deal. But the point is, you have to work for it. You have to invest something into it. You have to be prepared to give what's needed. Otherwise, go to Walmart. You'll get a pro product for a very, very cheap price. But then don't complain if you feel cheated, because the next day it breaks. That's not our responsibility, right? We're going to give you high quality things. But it's not going to be casino style. You have to come in and you have to invest something here. Right? You have to put something. So both sides are being made clear in that verse. Dharma projita kaitava. We're not going to cheat you. But then nirmat saranam satam. Then you too don't come in with a cheating mentality. Right? Be honest in this situation. And then together, Vedyam vastava matra vastu shivadam. We can get the most valuable thing that's there. Vedyam. That is atra vastu shivadam. That is actually vastu. That is re really substantive in nature. So Bhagavatam starts off with rejecting projita, all other dharmas. Where does Bhagavad Gita end? Sarva dharman parityaja. Krishna is making an order, right? Give up. Now here's the cool part. That order is in the imperative. Sarva dharman parityajya. Last instruction of the Gita. Give up all dharmas. I know I spent the last 18 chapters encouraging you to follow your dharma. But now, here's something better. Give up all dharmas and just refuge. Take refuge in me. Bhagavatam dharma projita. Projita is the past passive sense. It has been given up. Right? It's gone. So Bhagavatam begins where the Gita leaves off. It's saying, we're not going to waste your time with any other you know, trinket on the side, any other cheap deal. No, this is it. We've already given that stuff up, Dharma Projita. And therefore, we're ready to give you what is actually real, Vedyam Vastavam. And to this verse is one of my all-time favorite lines from Prabhupada's translations of Bhagavatam, right? uh, he, where he defines what is knowledge. It, it's a translation of this line. Uh, but sometimes translations become classics of literature in their own right, like the version of the Bible. It's a translation of the Bible, but you don't read it as a translation. It's its, its own personality. It's, the translation becomes the literature itself. Uh, and this is one of these moments where Prabhupada translates Vedyam Vastavam, Atra Vastu Shivadam, that line. He says, knowledge is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. I mean, where could you get a better definition of knowledge? So beautiful. Reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. And both of those elements, look at any other translation of Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu Shivadam, any other translation out there, and it will sound anemic compared to this one. <laughs> really? Because it, it juxtaposes two important things that the verses, it actually draws out a layer of meaning that you would not notice otherwise. What? The Bhagavatam is giving you what is real, reality distinguished from illusion. We would all say, okay, that's knowledge. Knowledge means separating fact from fiction. 
Reality distinguished from illusion. Vedyam vastavam. What is really vastava? What is actual? But it doesn't stop at that. It's a reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. There has to be a practical purpose. It has to have a transformative effect on the reader, on the listener. Otherwise, it's not knowledge. It may be information, it may be fact, it may be accurate, but it's not It cannot count as vidya unless it has a positive effect on the person who has the knowledge. And we live in a world riddled with information which is either of no benefit or of harm. Look at nuclear technology, for example. It's real, right? It's actual. It's a fact about the nature, the power of the atom. And yet when it falls as an atomic bomb, is that shivadam? Is it auspicious for the world? No, quite the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> so how? How can you say it's knowledge? Right? It's not Bhagavatam not what we're going to talk about. Right? So look at how specifically the Bhagavatam is identifying its content. We're going to give up anything that is not giving the ultimate thing. And even when it comes to ultimate matters, if it's not good for you, we won't talk about it. Right? In other words, everything in Bhagavatam has a use. It's meant to make our lives auspicious, to improve us. Just because it's true, even ultimately true, is not enough. Right? There's all kinds of philosophical, pedantic discussions that one could have about the nature of God in eternity that are interesting, they're about reality, but have no practical value whatsoever. Bhagavatam is saying, we're not concerned with that. We're concerned with what is shivadam, what is actually good for you, what is useful for you. So therefore, the Bhagavatam says, with that kind of content, kim va parair. Why else do you need anything else in this world? What's the use of other books? This beautiful Bhagavatam, Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad means beautiful. This beautiful Bhagavata, Mahamuni Krite, written by the great uh, Muni, the great sage, Vyasadev. Kimva right? Parayar, why else do you need anything else? Right? Why else do you need anything else besides this? The ultimate result, sadyo hridya varudya tetra kritipis, the Lord is established within the heart is an irrevocable fact. He's there. Paktir bhavati naishtaki. He's there forever. And so Prabhupada, in the preface of Sh uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, if you haven't read this preface, I would encourage you, first thing you do, go home, is read the preface. And if you haven't read it for a long time, go home and read it again. If we had more time, I would read it here for you. But it is one of the most beautiful, I think, and concise and profound presentations of Krishna consciousness and the mission of our movement, as you can find anywhere. Prabhupada has one of these amazing other lines where he says, this uh, book is meant for, he quotes this verse, Tadvag visargo janataga viplavo. He says, this book is meant for a rev to bring about a revolution in the impious lives of this world's misdirected civilization. I mean, that line, it's like this is prose poetry, right? You were talking about prose. To bring about a revolution in the impious lives of this world's misdirected civilization. Where can you find a better mission statement than that, right? So profound, so beautiful. The whole thing like has this rhythm to it. It just rhymes. And so he begins very humbly. He says, even if perfectly composed, uh, it is accepted and heard and by those who are thoroughly honest. And there's that point of honest, right? No gamblers, no cheaters. By people who are honest, who are willing to put in what they want to get out of the book. Of course, we will see, and hopefully we've started seeing already, there's nothing imperfectly composed about this great literature or about Prabhupada's translations and purports, which we'll talk about a little later. But um, uh, he writes, he begins in all that humility to say, this is what I'm presenting uh, here in uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay? Uh, right in that second verse, the Bhagavatam presents its um, content, what makes it 
unique and different from other books. It presents the adhikara, or the qualification of the reader and the listener. And it's very upfront. In other words, it's saying, look, you know, there's nothing wrong with other scriptures. If your goal is to get material opulence, then there are other books that might serve you better than this one. So we're not condemning anything else. We're just clarifying our product, and we have a right to do that. <laughs> this is the highest thing. Don't expect anything else. And if you want something, I mean to say there's a place for Walmart in the world, right? There's a place for low quality, low price products. Sometimes all you want is toilet paper and nothing else. So why would you buy something encrusted with gold, right? I know <laughs> this, it's, this is, it's, it serves its purpose, right? It's good, it's useful, it's nice. But if you're looking for jewelry, Walmart is not the place to buy. They say that, actually. You can find all find the studies. If you're looking for high-end products, don't go to Walmart. Number one, they'll cry exactly the same or more, and you'll have lower selection available than at other stores that specialize in high-end products. So the point is, here's a high-end product. This is what you're looking for, come here. If we lose some customers, it's okay. Vyasadev wrote all of Vedic literature for everyone, right? Is the highest, this is the essence. Now, all throughout Srimad Bhagavatam, you find the Bhagavatam describing its uniqueness, it demonstrating its uniqueness of content over and over again. What we are presenting here is ahaituki apratihata bhakti, unmotivated, unin uninterrupted, loving devotional service to the Lord, and nothing else. Take a look at the story of the Ramayana, for example. Ninth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Shukadev Goswami begins that story by telling Parikshit Maharaj, you have heard this story many times already. By that time, by the time of the Bhagavatam, 5,000 years ago, we know that the Ramayana was already something everyone knew. And he says there are so many versions of it. You know this story. But in brief. Okay? Now, this is a great case study. Because you have something that is widely read and widely known, and because Parikshit Maharaj and Shukadev Goswami, the speaker in the audience, already know the story well, Whatever you find in the Bhagavatam's version has to be what Bhagavatam wants to emphasize, right? The Bhagavatam's approach to the story. In, in other words, it's a great case study to get at the essence of what the Bhagavatam is about. Because you're hearing something that is so oft repeated, so clearly the reason to tell that story wouldn't be, oh, you've never heard the story, so let me tell you, okay? <laughs> means maybe with the story of Puranjana, that could be the reason. Maybe it's a unique story. But not with the Ramayana, we know that. So what is it? Why is he telling the story again? And if you read the ninth, the, those few chapters, you get such a clear, in, clear indication of what the Bhagavatam is promising in the second or third verse. For one thing, all the major elements of plot Shukadev Goswami will run through like that, right? He will tell, he's got one verse in which he goes through half of Lord Ramachandra's life. And he'll just go, chik, 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 chik. And you know, he did this. And so he was born, he was son of Dashratha. And he went to the forest with Vishwamitra. And this happened, that happened. He was exiled to the forest. And we're just, chik, chik, chik. And you can clearly tell he's speaking to someone who's going, uh-huh, uh-huh, okay, okay, I know, yeah, yeah. We know the story. And then he'll stop. And he'll spend five verses on something. And then he'll move on again with this hectic pace. And then he'll stop and spend five verses. Where does he stop? Where does he wait? What does he focus on? One thing. He's focusing particularly on any moments where he can savor the relationship between Lord Ramachandra and his devotees. He is not so interested in the fact that Lord Ramachandra was exiled and the reasons for that exile. That's the political story. But what he is interested in is the mood of Bharata when Bharata lost Lord Ramachandra 
and his mood when he returned, and that famous Ram Bharat Milan, their union that happens again afterwards. He spends several verses focusing on the separation that Bharata felt and the residents of Ayodhya felt as their life was torn away from them when Lord Ramachandra left. He's not so interested in the dynamics of how Mother Sita was stolen. <laughs> but when Lord Ramachandra and his grief at that separation, he stops and he savors that mood and that feeling again. Every time there's a moment of separation, particularly not just any relationship, but viraha, but separation. There's one scholar named Friedhelm Hardy who talks about this, how viraha bhakti, uh, devotional service in the mood of separation, is one of the trademark qualities of Bhagavatam that sets it apart from other Puranas that also tell the story of Lord Krishna and Lord Ram and Lord Vama and Devan, etc. Is the Bhagavatam is particularly saving love or service in separation. The importance of love and separation. Have we heard this before? Does it sound familiar? This is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's philosophy. One of the things that happens when you study Bhagavatam is you can see Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's philosophy is directly a product of Srimad Bhagavatam. It's not that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu comes up with this philosophy and then we find verses in the Bhagavatam to prove it. It's the other way around. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Srimad Bhagavatam Pramanam Amalam. This is the highest truth. This is the source of knowledge. He means it. Whatever the Bhagavatam says, that's what we build our philosophy around. When you meet Prahlad Maharaj for the first time in the story of Lord Nishingadev, do you know what he's doing? What environment do we meet him in? What's the first picture we get of him? He's crying tears of joy. He's in an ecstatic state, experiencing all the moods and emotions that we read about in Chaitanya Charitamrita. This is unheard of in other Puranas. We, that's how we meet him, not as a playful young boy, not as a learned, a precocious child. We meet him as someone who's going through waves of separation from the Lord. Viraha again. Do you know in the story of the Rasa Leela and the gopis and Krishna where the Bhagavatam spends all its time? In the moments of separation. Like the Gopi Gita, for example. When Krishna is lost, when he's absent, and therefore increasing the love of the gopis for him. Bhagavatam is really giving the highest and saying this is what we're focusing on, is that unflinching love for the Lord. And so powerful is that Lord, that, we, that love, that bhakti, so supreme it is, that we will show you that it defeats every other consideration. So another characteristic of Bhagavatam that you find everywhere, besides descriptions of viraha bhakti, of this highest love, of devotional service, the focus on the Lord and his devotees, is that in demonstrating this relationship between the Lord and devotees, the Bhagavatam is always giving us role reversals. Okay? But what I mean by role reversals is the typical relationships in this world that you would expect, the hierarchies that you would expect are turned upside down just to show that when you are a devotee, then everything else is secondary. So, children teach adults in Bhagavatam. Demons are praised over the demigods. Kings are higher placed than Brahmins. Wives turn out to be smarter than husbands. Right? <laughs> Again and again. Animals are better than humans. Bhagavatam tells us accounts of the Lord's relationship with his devotees that turn worldly relationships upside down in order to highlight that when the relationship is present with Krishna, then everything else is secondary.
think about the story of Ritrasura. This is a story that is so ancient, it comes all the way from the Rig Veda. In the Rig Veda, Indra is praised as the killer of Ritra. All throughout the Vedas, this is Indra's most important accomplishment, is he killed the great demon Ritra. He's the great hero of the heavenly planets and of earth for conquering this demon. In the Bhagavatam, who's the hero of the story? Vritrasura. The demon, that horrific looking demon, and he was horrific in his looks. Big, the, the, the stereotypical demon, red eyes and big hair and fangs and all of that, big size, all of that. And in the story of Ritrasura, as my mother was talking about yesterday, he's sitting there and uh, Indra and he are fighting. And at one point Indra becomes very depressed and says, I, there's no way I can kill this demon. And he sits down and starts sulking and moping. And you know what happens? It's really funny. Ritra sort of shows up and says, hey, stand up. This is your duty. You're meant to kill me. So come on, do it. <laughs> and you know what uh, Indra says? You can have that kind of determination because you're a Mahabhagavata. He tells him, you're a Mahabhagavata. You're a great devotee. You can have that kind of devotion and sacrifice, come kill me, right? But I'm not like that, you know? I get depressed and I get <laughs> tired and I get... And Vritrasura inspires him with his devotional service to come and kill him so that he can fulfill what the Lord's wishes are. He comes out as the great and glorious hero of a story. Bhagavatam reveals a side to Vritrasura that is found in no other Purana. And this is why when Sridhar Swami at the beginning of first verse of Bhagavatam, he defines what is Bhagavatam. He gives a verse describing the, how would you recognize the Bhagavatam? Suppose all the covers were taken off the books. How would you know this is Bhagavatam, this is Vishnu Purana? He names a few things, 18,000 verses, he says, lists the number of chapters. And then he says, this is the account, this is the book with the story of Ritrasura in it. And at first you think, what? Every book, Every scripture in India has a story of Vritrasura in it. Even Mahabharata has a story of Vritrasura, and the Ramayana does, and all the Puranas do, and the Rig Veda does. So how could this be a unique characteristic of Bhagavatam? Well, this is why. Because no other book gives the story in that way. No one reveals the, the nature of Vritrasura, shows him to be the hero. All to make this point that you might look horrible you might look like a demon, but that's not what Krishna's interested in. It's in the quality of the heart. And you might be a demigod, and it wouldn't matter. But if those demoniac qualities are present within the heart, then no, Krishna's not impressed. The story of Prahlad Maharaj is one of the longest running stories in the Bhagavatam. It, it encompasses 10 chapters of the Bhagavatam. Uh, there's only a couple other stories outside Krishna's story in the 10th canto that take up that much space. Uh, the churning of the ocean is pretty long also, maybe eight or nine. Ten chapters from start to finish. Who's the hero of that story in Bhagavatam? Prahlad Maharaj. You know how many of those ten chapters are dedicated primarily to Prahlad? Seven. Seven out of ten. He's the hero. Lord Nishingadev becomes a secondary character in the story. <laughs> which is, again, different from the other Puranas, different from other scriptures, where Lord Nishingadev's incarnation is a big deal. And here, it's Prahlad and his bhakti, which is the big deal. The fact that he's a child, and moreover, a demon child, who's demonstrating the highest form of bhakti and standing up to his father, which is against social norms. It's a role reversal again. Sons have to say yes, sir, to their father. And that's a good thing normally. But in this case, he's standing up to him and instructing him. If you look at the story of Vamanadev, again a story from the Vedas, Om Tat Vishnu Paramam Padam Sada Pashyanti Chure. Those verses, they describe Lord Vishnu's most important accomplishment. In Indra's most important accomplishment in the Vedas is killing Ritra. Vishnu's most important accomplishment in the Vedas, 
taking three steps, Trivikrama. All throughout Vedic literature, the story of Vamana is there. The great hero who covered three, in three paces of land, spanned the universe and thus demonstrated that he is the lord of this cosmos. In the Bhagavatam, who is the hero of the story? Bali Maharaj. Right? And he becomes glorified. And Krishna ends up a gatekeeper for him. The Lord is embarrassed in many ways in the Bhagavatam. He's lying, he's cheating, he's coming and he's taking away what is rightfully his. All to glorify his devotee, Bali Maharaj. And show that he is the greatest, he is the supreme. You know the story of the Brahmana's wives in 10th canto of Bhagavatam? That story ends up with the Brahmanas saying, fie on our learning and fie on our uh, uh, rituals and to hell with all of our purity. We here are the husbands and we're supposed to be the guru for our wives. And yet they have become our gurus. They've shown us that what the purpose of all this Vedas and Vedic sacrifice is. We were doing these Vedic sacrifices and God himself, the fire is meant to be the mouth of the Lord. You're feeding the Lord through the fire. And the Lord comes saying, I'm hungry, feed me. And we say, no, wait, I'm feeding the fire. <laughs> how could we do this? Right? How, could we, how could we make that mistake? And they express their gratitude to their wives. Say, uh, we thought women were supposed to be less intelligent. That's what they say. Despite their being women, they're actually our gurus. What's Bhagavatam saying? Well, we know what the social norms are. We know what dharma is, right? Generally a good thing. But here, dharma projeta. We're rejecting all those dharmas, sarva dharman. To just demonstrate to you that while in general, children ought to listen to their parents, but when bhakti is involved, all bets are off. There's no guarantee of anything. Because when Krishna enters the picture, an animal, Indra, can serve as a model for us human beings, even though animals are not worthy of paying attention to in terms of knowledge, normally speaking. Again and again, the Bhagavatam reverses so many roles just to highlight this one thing, the relationship between the Lord and his devotees. And this is why the Bhagavatam, in its third verse, comes to this very point. It says, Nigamakalpataror galitam palam shukamukha damrita dravasam yutam tabhagavatam rasamalayam muhraho rasika bhuvibhavuka. One might say, Are there not other books that give the highest truth for the welfare of all? And yes, the Bhagavad Gita does. It gives the highest truth for the welfare of all. There can be other books, but what makes the Bhagavatam very special? In the third verse, Bibata Bhagavatam Rasamalayam. That not only are we going to give you the highest truth for everyone's welfare, but we are only going to give you the juiciest parts, the rasa, the, the, the relationship, the mellow, that is present between the Lord and his devotees. That's what we're going to give you. And the other things, yes, they'll be there. But to the extent that we have time and space, just like with the Ramayana story, I'll tell you the whole story to the extent that I have time. But what I want to focus on, rasa. Pibata bhagavatam rasamalayam. Because, my dear Parikshit, this is what I'm here for, to drink that rasa. This is what I've asked you to do, Bibata. It's an order in Bhagavatam. Drink this Rasamalayam. From where? Nigama Kalpataror Galitam Phalam. This is the fruit of the Vedic desire tree. Galitam. You know, in, the, in, the word, in, in Hindi we have the word gala. When a fruit, well, gala means what? It's ripened. You know, to the point practically of being overripe. It's so juicy. Galitam Phalam. So we're giving you 
the fruit of the Vedic desire tree in its ripest form, galetam phalam. One could argue, and one would be right, that the Bhagavad Gita is the essence of the Vedic desire tree. It's the fruit. But it's not as ripened as the Bhagavatam is. Right? It means you have, to, you have to squeeze a little harder to get the juice. You have to wait to let it ripen a bit. We read and read and we understand, oh, Krishna's relationship with Arjuna is shining forth here. Obvious, right? It's, you, have to, you have to wait a little bit. You have to work on it. Bhagavatam is just the moment you begin, the juice is flowing. It's the ripened fruit of that Vedic desire tree. Now, two things about the fruit. Okay. The fruit of a tree. Number one, it's the goal, it's the result of that tree. It's, I mean, for us, it's the goal of planting a fruit tree, but also for the tree itself, right? It means a tree lives for it to give its fruit because that it's, that's the ultimate, you know, just like uh, marriage is made successful by the birth of a child, right? So a tree, for a tree, it's success, it's giving its fruit, it's reproducing, it's furthering itself in the world, making, offering some benefit for the world. So on one level, the fruit is the result, it's the goal of the whole tree. So all of the Vedas, the goal is Bhagavatam. That's what's being given. And this is why Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Veda ischa sarvair aham eva vedya. Right? This is the goal, and Bhagavatam is Krishna. So he, but also, the other thing is, what does the fruit contain within it? The seed. And the seed has what? The whole tree. So not only is it the result of the Vedas, but also all the Vedas are contained within Bhagavatam. So this is why Vyasadeva says, Kim va parair. Why do we need anything else? Not only do you have the, the, the result of it, but in, just in case you're looking for any of the other stuff, that's not, you're looking for the leaves, or you're looking for the branches, you're looking for some ritual or whatever it is, you're looking for some material benefit even. It's okay, those who are eating the fruit will think you're crazy to eat the seed, but it's there, right? <laughs> it's there. It's there. Or you can plant the seed and watch the tree grow and take the branches if you want. Uh, from the perspective of Shukadeva Goswami, why would you want to? When you have the ripened mango, you don't need the mango tree. But just in case you do, you can plant it and you can have everything that's present in the Vedas. It's all there. And one of the things we'll see tomorrow is Jiva Goswami, he attempts to demonstrate this in Bhagavad where he correlates the verses of Bhagavatam with the sutras of the Vedanta Sutra with the Gayatri Mantra, with the Vedas, and he says, look, it's here. All of that meaning is here in Bhagavatam. It's pregnant with the meanings of all the Vedas, if you want that. But his whole point in showing it is to say, all the meanings are there, therefore don't worry about all of them, just study Bhagavatam, because you'll get it all when it's present here. Now, one final twist on that is that Sridhar Swami, in his commentary to this third verse, he says, actually the Bhagavatam is a very unique kind of fruit. Because we're being asked, Pibata Bhagavatam Rasamalaya, just drink this fruit of the Bhagavatam. Normally you can't drink a fruit. Okay? You have to juice it first. And the biggest impediments for that juicing, seed and peel. So Sridhar Swami says, the Bhagavatam is a fruit so unique that it has no seed and no peel. Not even the fiber which comes out the other end of the juicer. It's a fruit that's just juice. So drink it, Bibata. You can actually drink it. You don't have to chew, you don't have to swallow, nothing. Just drink it. So the point being, hopefully you've seen how the first the second and third verse of Bhagavatam, which really define its purpose, its meaning. The Bhagavatam really sticks closely to that purpose. All throughout the book, 
in the, so many of the examples I gave you with Prahlad and Ritra and Ramayana and everything, the Bhagavatam is delivering that promise. It has this relentlessly focused message. Bhakti trumps all. It supersedes everything. This is the only thing worth achieving. It's the Panchama Purushartha, the highest human goal is, is this. So, um, uh, we have uh, 10 minutes left. Uh, maybe uh, we pause here and see uh, what questions people have. Uh, there may be general questions from the past, part of the presentation, or about the Mahabharata and things like that, but I request you, uh, if you can prioritize the questions that are specifically focus on what we've just discussed uh, in, since, the, since the last break, that would be terrific because it would help us continue with the, with the theme. Uh, yes, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Uh, thank you so much, Prabhuji, for bringing so wonderful points. It uh, really attracted us to read more Bhagavatam and to go deeper. And one short reflection I was just having that how Srila Prabhupada uh, given us like like when he when he administered this con moment, he has just taken that mood that what is devotion, whatever is required to spread Krishna consciousness, maybe it's woman or whether whatever. He has administered in the same way how the Bhagavatam teaches that what is important is bhakti, not any other, other thing. Yes. So I was just uh, reflecting on that point. Yeah. And wonderful. Thank and the question I have is, uh, uh, you are telling that like many and. It, Mainly, uh, Sukhde Goswami has emphasized on rasas and part, but we see that m many sections of Bhagavatam is filled with creation, sub-creation, and, and, and so if you can elaborate like why that, that things are there. And yes, so uh, that's a good point. Uh, so many sections of the Bhagavatam uh, talk about many technical matters also, very philosophical matters, cos cosmology, creation, and all of that. Now. Let's use this logic that I've been talking about in reverse. If Bhagavatam is the fruit with no seed and no peels that should be drunk, it means that if in those sections we do not find that rasa, that juice, then it means there's something wrong in our appreciation of the Bhagavatam. There's something lacking there. Because for Parikshit Maharaj, who is the first drinker, and Shukadev Goswami, He's not just wading through those sections to get over. Uh, it's like the prayers in Bhagavatam, right? It's just, okay, one prayer after another, after another, after another. Uh, I remember as a kid, uh, when we were reading Bhagavatam, prayers were often the toughest part to get through. You, you'd go through a, a story and the plot line's moving well. Have you noticed how often the Bhagavatam will break the plot line for prayers? It's almost guaranteed. If Anyone meets Krishna, they're going to stop and there's going to be 25 prayers that come <laughs> after that point. And you think we're just getting to the good part. And it's so predictable. For, for a lot of us, I know for myself, it's often like, oh gosh, okay, but let's get to the story. And all the prayers sound pretty much the same. You're beyond the modes of material nature, you're the beginning of creation. Like, and you think, oh gosh, okay, but it's my duty I have to read. But do you know why the Bhagavatam is interested in the prayers so much? Why? From the, on the basis of what we've just described. Yes, because those prayers are the clearest indicator of the relationship that the Lord shares with that devotee. And if you try reading those prayers in that light, all of a sudden they become completely different. Instead of these instead of reading them in this impersonal, philosophical fashion, oh, here we go again. If you read them as two people talking to each other, both who have share a very deep and wonderful relationship, watch what happens to those prayers. They'll completely sound different, and you'll begin to appreciate them in a much deeper and much sweeter way. The way that Queen Kunti prays to Lord Krishna, is so different from the way King Yudhishthira prays. If you go through the fifth canto and the prayers of the different uh, residents of, uh, 
of Jambu Dwipa. There's Kim Puru Shavar Shaloka and this Loka and that Loka, and they're all praying. Notice how every devotee prays to the Lord, identifies the aspects of the Lord about which they have the most appreciation and direct experience. Queen Kunti will glorify the Lord in relation to the family that she knows. And Yudhishthira will glorify the Lord in the context of kingship and being the king and what that means. And Bhishma Dev will glorify the Lord in a particular way. But even those devotees with whom we don't have so much, we don't know so much their stories, like the demigods praying to Krishna in the womb. Notice how they're glorifying the Lord. What are the demigods concerned with? How much they're concerned with the preservation of this world, for example. Keep of the cycles of dharma and so on. Whereas other devotees are not at all concerned with that. They're concerned with something else, right? So you see that the Lord, like a gem, is reflected in a particular light through the prayers of one devotee. Their mood is relevant, is apparent. Just like if you read biographies and the accounts of devotees who know Srila Prabhupada. Not only is Prabhupada's story and his life told, but the relationship of the devotee with Prabhupada is reflected in that account, the mood in which they knew Srila Prabhupada. Right? So that is how we get to know Krishna's body. This is how we get to know him, is we see him through the eyes of these various devotees. That's the Bhagavatam's fundamental point. You want to know Krishna, you see him through rasa, that is, through his devotees. Don't try to know him in isolation. So in all these accounts, through creation and through the descriptions of so many things, it's there, right? That factor of relationship is there. The Lord's, what he's willing to do for this material world and what the devotees are willing, that's there in the Bhagavatam. But often we just, we don't see it. We don't take it, right? And this is why Prabhupada, in the preface, he talks so nicely. He says, anyone who works the nine cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam will be a self-realized soul by the end of nine cantos. Right? It's a guarantee Prabhupada is giving. You will be self-realized by the end of nine cantos. Then the tenth canto is like going to be pure ananda. It's going to be pure bliss. All the hard work of self-realization, of purifying our heart, is all done by, through the nine cantos. But for Parikshad Maharaj and Shukadev Goswami, everything was as rasika, it was as juicy as everything else. Right? That's, we have to keep that in mind. Is Parikshad Maharaj is propelling the answers to these questions. Uh, he's not having to sit through them uh, in the way that we might have to. Thank you very much. Yes. <clears throat> so, just wanted to repeat the same question again and, uh, for the audience also and for, for myself. Um, as you know, the Bhagavatam Chatur Sloki from Brahma, then uh, Sukadev Goswami talked to Parikshit Maharaj. So, the numerical count of 18,000, which is beginning from what Vyas Dev has written or what Sukadev Goswami talking to Parikshit Maharaj, if it is, then how come Sudha Goswami's uh, induction of those slokas is also included in the 18,000 because past event which has happened in Noemi Saranya just after the discussion with Sukadev Goswami and Parikshit Maharaj. Could you please elaborate on that? Okay, uh, I think I understand the question. So, uh, essentially you're asking why earlier accounts of Bhagavatam are included in the count for 18,000? I mean, from what I understand, 18,000 refers to the Bhagavatam as we have it today. It's 18,000 verses long, as in other Puranas and Sridhar Swami give this number of 18,000. So what we have today is 18,000 verses, including different layers. So including Brahma and, and uh, Lord Vishnu, including Narada to Vyasa, including uh, Shukadev Goswami to Maharaj Parikshit, including Sudha Goswami to the sages. All of that included is 18,000. That's the count we're given. Now, technically speaking, if you... If you just go through Bhagavatam and you count the verses, right, or you just add up the total number in each chapter, uh, and there's, I forget now how many, 300 or so chapter? 335 chapters. So you'll come to something around 14,000 verses, 14,000 something or another. Uh, but uh, usually or often one way of counting verses is because verses come in different lengths and often you don't have verses, uh, you have the prose, right? So 
often the way of counting these in for, for Sanskrit literature is to take the shloka, the anushtub shloka of 32 syllables. I talked about this, Sarvadharman Parityaja. Take that as the standard measurement for what a verse is, 32 syllables. And then divide the total number of syllables by 32, in which case you get the total number, right? So that way you can account for length in terms of prose, the prose passages, longer verses, uh, and so on. Verses, it would be unfair to count them as one verse if you're counting a very short verse as one verse too. In other words, this is a measure of length. And measures of length uh, are important because if you need to know how long the book will be, how long it'll take to read, how long it'll take for the scribe to write, how much you should pay him, that kind of stuff depends on length of book. So how to get a fair estimation of length? You can't tell the scribe, oh, it's only 700 verses, and all 700 verses are shardula vikritam. That would be unfair, right? So what you have to do is take it and divide by 32, and that gives you a standard length. Now, I don't know of anyone who's counted the number of syllables in Bhagavatam and divided by 32. But the estimation is, or people t say that, if you were to do that, you would come closer to the figure of 18,000 rather than the 14,000, which is the raw count, just like that. Okay. Uh, other questions? Uh, okay, we here and then we go there. Thank you for the class. And I think three years before you gave a wonderful seminar how to bring Christ children in Krishna consciousness. When we distribute this Srimad Bhagavatam, we send it uh, this video like just everybody. Now we have more coming. <laughs> Thank you. For, uh, one question I have this commentaries like. Just write the commentaries like Sri Basham, like Ramanuja and other Acharyas. They take it as a Bhagavatam as the uh, the core or or the like w what the commentary is all about. They they take it as all Vedas as essence or uh, um, so the question is uh, Acharyas um, what do they regard as the essence of uh, uh, I, d I don't understand the question. The commentaries they write, uh -huh. right? So they have a Sri Basham as Ramanuja, yes, yes. and also Shankara as his commentary yes. on Advaitam. So they take our, like our Jiva Goswami take yes. as Srimad Bhagavatam as, like oh. nor normally if you become an Acharya, means what they take as a commentary is, like they take as Bhagavatam or Bhagavad Gita or Mahabharata. Yeah, so uh, the, the standard books for commentaries are Vedanta Sutra, Bhagavad Gita, uh, Upanishads and um, uh, and Vedanta Sutra. Okay, these are the uh, Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita, uh, uh, Vedanta Sutra, and um, oh, these three rather. I'm not saying four. Prasthanatraya, Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita, and Vedanta Sutra. These are the standards for commentaries. Uh, but Bhagavatam, you have so many commentaries simply because the Acharya just love the Bhagavatam. They, I mean, in terms of philosophical establishing these, those are the three texts you would use to establish your philosophy um, on purely philosophical grounds. But Bhagavatam, as we've seen, does so much more than just philosophy. So it attracts all the acharyas towards commentary, to create commentaries on it uh, because of its uh, amazing rasika qualities, the rasa that's present there. Yes, Prabhu. Considering the exalted nature of the Srimad Bhagavatam, can you give a comment about what's taking place when we approach the homes of people in apartments who are smoking cigarettes, eating anything, and somehow or other place a set of Bhagavatam inside? Yes. Can, you, can you give us a, a synopsis of what's actually taking place? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, we heard the sun, the sun is rising with the Bhagavatam in the darkness of Kali Yuga. When the Bhagavatam shows up in a place, everything is bright and beautiful and sunny, okay? Uh, but when it comes into a place where there's so much sinful activity happening, it's kind of like the sun rising in Beijing or Shanghai on a particularly polluted day, right? Where literally the sun is obscured but not entirely, okay, not entirely, means even though the sun is not clearly visible, any light present in the environment is a result of the sun. Think about a cloudy day, right? completely cloudy and completely dark. Uh, 
And yet, it's not night, right? No one confuses the day for night because there's still so much light, even through the densest of clouds, that seeps through. And the warmth. The, the warmth of the day is always more than the coldness of the night. Why? Because, again, even on the densest of clouds, the heat of the sun is always present. So when Bhagavatam arrives in a place that is otherwise so polluted and otherwise so problematic, its qualities may not be manifest as brilliantly as they are on a sunny day in California, but it's no doubt it's there. And the only way to get rid uh, this is not the greatest analogy considering you're going through such a bad drought, but the only way to dissipate clouds is what? The presence of the sun, right? The sun is the only thing that can dissipate the clouds, even though it's the clouds that cover the sun. So my point is that even though the environment may seem to obscure the power of the Bhagavata, someone may open the book and go, oh, what? This is weird. This is far out. But the only way to wake someone out of that, ooh, that, 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 that state of half-awakeness is the Bhagavata, you see? So that very thing which seems to hide the Bhagavata can be dissipated only by the presence of the Bhagavata. Otherwise, there's, there's no hope. You know, there's no hope whatsoever. The darkness would be, would be permanent. It would be eternal. Uh, so uh, it's... Uh, the, the the effect of Bhagavatam is going to be unavoidable. Uh, in the life of a, you know, the five most potent aspects of devotional service. And the reason they're called the most potent aspects is because even a little bit of contact with any one of those five can lead one to the best result in the end. So it's proportionate. Uh, it's like a touchstone. It just touches something and it turns into gold. And so Bhagavatam is one of those five, deity, devotee, nam, dham, and Bhagavatam, right? Those five things. And when you have a devotee, who's one of the five, presenting Srimad Bhagavatam, which is also one of the five, there's just practically no chance that there's going to be failure. Right? It's just, it's definitely going to be successful. That's going to transform the, the situation, the environment. So I think this would be uh, a good place uh, up. Um, we've exceeded our time. And uh, I know that there are other questions, but we will continue again uh, tomorrow. Uh, just to give you a little uh, overview, tomorrow we're going to look specifically about what Jiva Goswami has to say about Bhagavatam, how he correlates the Bhagavatam with the Sutra and other scriptures how he extracts the essence of the Bhagavatam in six verses in particular. And uh, finally, we will look at his commentary on one of those six verses, which Jiva Goswami describes as the reasoning verse of Bhagavatam. That verse conveys the Bhagavatam's argument as a whole. What is Bhagavatam trying to argue? So, uh, and then that argument essentially is an argument through which Jiva Goswami he proves, using dull matter, he proves the existence of the soul. And using the soul, he proves the existence of the super soul. And using the super soul, he proves the existence of the Supreme Lord, uh, the personality of Godhead. Uh, so in contrast to today, tomorrow's talk is going to be a bit more technical. Uh, so I'm going to be standing up most of the time. We'll be using the board uh, for writing down terms. I'll talk about aspects of Indian logic and how interpretation is done about the Bhagavatam and focus on Jiva Goswami's elements of it. So it's, the, it's going to be a, a different sort of approach uh, tomorrow. Uh, the goal today was to give you uh, um, really the glories of the Bhagavatam.
in terms of the big perspective. So you can stand there, and it's like opening the windows uh, uh, and and uh, uh, seeing a, a beautiful scene outside, like you're looking down into a valley or at a range of mountains. Just the the wow experience. Wow, this is really. I'm a that it's both beautiful and majestic at the same time. And um, uh, that was the goal for today, the glories of the Bhagavatam from that macro perspective. And then we're going to try to dig in more specifically to a couple of areas tomorrow to give you uh, the feel for the more micro perspective. We take a few verses and pull them apart and show what Jiva Goswami extracts from them. <laughs> so, uh, let's see how long I can run. So, thank you all very much for your attention today. Vayam tu mavrtrama utama shloka vikrame yashin vatam rasagyanam swadu swadu pade pade. But I hope I speak on your behalf. But this is the culmination of my year. The, all the austerities and whatever we've done to distribute the Bhagavatam and read the Bhagavatam is now coming to bear th through the uh, digested realizations of Radhika Raman Prabhu. So we are very grateful for you dedicating your life to this process, and it's it's all nectar, just like it said in the Bhagavatam. So we thank you very, very much for coming here to ISV. I keep thinking this is like a little mini Naima Saranya. <laughs> <laughs> only instead of years, we only get a few hours. But uh, we're, I'm already praying in my heart for more. That This is really the standard of, of uh, talk on the Bhagavatam and on, on this philosophy that is completely satisfying. So please, one more time for Radhika. <laughs> And now for a practical application of the Srimad Bhagavatam's philosophy, let's uh, put away all the asans and get ready for prasadam and in the most orderly and efficient way that we can. Gaur Premanande Haribo!